Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. It's Hugh Hewitt on the West Coast for the last time this year. My delayed return to the Beltway is tomorrow. Looking forward to that. The cherry blossoms, there might be one or two left on the branches to view. Some of you might think that I arrange my travel so that I can uh, watch the Masters. And I really couldn't say that you're wrong. Warren, Ohio's own Jason Kokrak is in the hunt. One under, six back, uh, and very much in the hunt. Now, Jason and I played on the same golf team. Admittedly, 40 years apart, but it's the same golf team, Warren John F. Kennedy High School. So I'm thinking about getting down there, but I'm afraid of running into uh, the commissioner of Major League Baseball, Rob Manfred. I don't know that he's resigned from Augusta yet. I thought he was going to. I thought he was not going to ever set foot in Georgia again. But I'm going down there to see Jason Kokrak get that green jacket. Uh, I gave up golf after high school, and so uh, I haven't played with Jason, but I'd be happy to line putts up for him. And I've caddied a few times since then. I was in a tournament with Rob Ganeri. It was uh, best ball out of uh, two-man teams for uh, 45 holes, member guest. And uh, uh, Rob's ball was the best ball in 44 out of 45 holes and so after that I wasn't invited back and they never let me play it all went downhill when I was on the White House golf team in the uh, in 1985 to 86 I, the, the, I actually was the fastest guy on the White House running team the Nike challenge every year and that was a pretty fast running team Dick Hauser was on that too he was the coach of that and he was the coach of the golf team and the chief justice was on that but I was the fastest runner but I never made the cut for the White House golf team in 85-86 it was it was actually kind of unfair. I had to stay behind and and defend the seal of the United States. Coach Hauser never let me play. Roberts always hit it down the middle. Pipeline John Roberts. Fred was not much of a contributor. He was always on one of those big old satellite phones of the 80s. David Waller, always the best dressed golfer on the course. Mike Ludig could smash the ball. I mean, really smash it. But everything went right, sometimes way right. He'd hook it. But I never got to play on the traveling squad. Coach Hauser would look at me and say, nah, yeah, maybe next week, Hewitt. And he'd put on his golf glove and strive up. That's why he's a three handicap. He's coming back to D.C. too. And I think he travels on this weekend because he can watch the Masters. But it's a real treat when you fly west to east and the Masters is on. It's the, uh, it's the, 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 the tournament of the year. I don't, I watch the Open sometimes too, and I, I turn on the British Open to see if it's raining, but mostly I watch the Masters. And I like that they got the old guys in there, right? Curtis Strange is out there making jokes. Um, Gary Player's back. Jack is always around somewhere talking about hitting the golf ball. Jack has never used, another great Ohio man, Jack has never used the term golf without the term ball, if you listen to him closely. I was hitting the golf ball pretty well today. You know, the, the secret is putting the golf ball on the green. Um, if the golf ball goes out of bounds, just got to race it, got to hit the next shot. Yeah, I just love listening to him talk about golf. But I, I, I personally have given up the game. Although I, I'm happy to coach everyone. Philip Mokris is a, a lawyer in Tampa. Many of you, he's, he's a very superb lawyer in Tampa and was my... Uh, co-player along with Roop and uh, Johnny Phillips and a bunch of people. I, I, look, I was the team leader then, and Philip would look to me for guidance, and I would help him out. But And I still do that whenever possible. But nowadays, I just don't play. I just watch. Uh, it's sort of like my talking about golf is like Joe Biden talking about guns, which he did yesterday. And that's, that's all you need to know. We got Sonny Bunch coming up today. An early Hillsdale dialogue. It stops at uh, 33 of the next hour. Uh, Rick Grinnell, Ambassador Rick Grinnell, former ambassador to Germany, former acting director of national intelligence, rumored candidate for California governor or California Senate, is coming along today. Let's do a quick rundown of the headlines. Egypt says it has uncovered a vast, untouched, lost city. I think actually President Sisi just landed in Pittsburgh. But actually, they've got pictures here of a city that's 3,000 years old. And it's near Luxor. And it's, uh, they found a tomb. 
Nothing in the tomb. They found a tomb. So that means somebody else was there first, I think. Or they haven't found the real tomb yet. But it's a big deal. Uh, the numbers at the border are not good. They are the opposite of good. They're terrible. Um, they are um, spending $60 million a week to shelter unaccompanied minors. And the numbers are staggering. The staggering number of people, since Joe Biden said, alley, alley, in free, and threw the doors open. And the trouble is, the, the kids and the children, the unaccompanied kids and the kids with their moms, show up at the, uh, they turn themselves in and the Border Patrol has to take care of them. And then the unaccompanied men, often accompanied by drugs or guns, are zipping across unnoticed. Fastest growing group was family units, 52,904 family units taken into custody. That's, that's amazing in one month. In March, in March, 172,331 migrants taken into custody. 18,809 of them minors. Yikes. Great job go me messaging President Biden. Great job messaging. And that's 60 million bucks a week. Unaccompanied children at U.S.-Mexico border hits record high, according to the Times of London. They say 19,000 unaccompanied children at the southwest border. Meanwhile, member Canada, Adam's a Canadian. We should go out with the uh, railroad song, the one I like by Gordon Lightfoot. This is a Canadian story. Remember how a Canadian health care? All we've ever heard about is Canadian health care from Rahm Emanuel's brother, Emmanuel Emanuel, whatever his name is. Dr. Death. He's always saying we should do the Canadian single payer. Wall Street Journal is U.S. vaccinates millions for COVID-19. Most Canadians are still waiting. It's complete Justin Trudeau screw up. Socialist government. Absolutely remarkably broken rollout of covid but remember, Canada's got single payer. Single payer always works. George Floyd, died. this is not exactly a headline. George Floyd died of low oxygen. Now I got to get Andy McCarthy on because Andy thinks the defense has done some good work in planning doubt as to cause of death and legitimate use of force. I'm not persuaded. I think George Floyd is, is, was murdered. And I think Chauvin is guilty, guilty, guilty. But that's what I thought about O.J. Simpson, too. You know, I would have convicted O.J. in about five seconds. Uh, and so uh, people who've been at the Department of Justice tend to be rather conclusory about these matters. If you get charged in the system, you're guilty, guilty, guilty. And unless it's a DNA mix up, screw up. And so I think Chauvin's going to jail for second degree or manslaughter. Uh, he didn't intend to kill the man. He's recklessly indifferent to his life. Of George Floyd. So it's murder, but it's not premeditated. Guess what? This, this headline makes me laugh, kind of, and it makes me cry. New York City's wealthy will pay nation's highest tax rates. How will that affect a rebound? Question mark. Ha! How will that affect a rebound? Why do you think Miami real estate and Maine real estate, there isn't any to be had? It's because all the people in New York have said, Long Island's nice, but I'm going to Miami or Maine. That's what they're saying. And they just say, this is nice. I've enjoyed it. See ya. In California, 0.35% of the state left in December. Originally, the LA Times said 0.003%. No, they were only off 100 times. Then they overcorrected. They said it was 3.5%. It's 0.35%. That's a lot. And you know who those 0.35% are? the people who pay taxes. Here we go. A little Canadian that and Amazon is uh, not going to be unionized. It's like the railroad that they build up in Canada. There are no unions on that. And Amazon vote count union. The no's are way ahead of the yeses. Who wants a union these days? They take your money and then they just complain. Come on. Let's reopen Canada. You, you got to do it better than Justin Trudeau is. We'll be right back, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Even when they're not on some cable channel shock jock platform, they don't care. One of the bravest, best Americans I know was my colleague Sarah Huckabee Sanders. She's sitting there at the White House Correspondents Association annual dinner when somebody else who says she's a comedian, well, says this as she's standing next to her. Every time Sarah steps up to the podium, I get excited because I'm not really sure what we're going to get. You know, a press briefing, a bunch of lies, or divided into softball teams. <laughs> it's shirts and skins, and this time don't be such a little b Jim Acosta. <laughs> I actually really like Sarah. I think she's very resourceful. Like, she burns facts, and then she uses that ash to create a perfect smoky eye. <laughs> like, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's lies. Probably lies. <laughs> and I'm never really sure what to call Sarah Huckabee Sanders. You know, is it Sarah Sanders? Is it Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Is it Cousin Huckabee? Is it Auntie Huckabee Sanders? Like, what's Uncle Tom but for white women who disappoint other white women? Hilarious, Michelle Wolf. So when that party, when those people who voted for Joe Biden and for Hillary Clinton, tell you they care, they care about the illegal immigrants crossing our border. They're lying to you. They don't give a damn. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You cease to amaze me. It's sometimes the stupidity that comes out of your mouth. The expression is never cease to amaze me as you're calling me stupid. I'm just, just, I'm just saying. About the George Floyd trial. Quite Actually, it's the Derek Chauvin trial. George Floyd is dead. So, as you call me stupid, just pointing out a few things. They had white officers uh, uh, answering calls to white people. Two of them had knives. And in both instances, the officers took them down without any any incident. Why don't you have, have your research staff research that sometimes before you go around flapping your gums about... Uh, flapping my gums? Is that racist? It seems like uh, you just on one side of the fence all the time, the one that, that butters your bread, I guess. So you have a nice evening. On one side of the fence all the time. Time, the one that butters your bread. You have a nice e evening. I, I will say one more time, I'm sir. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. Welcome back, America. Friday is upon us. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Sunny Bunch coming up after the break. 
Uh, the Hillsdale Dialogue is early. We start midway through next hour, and then I'm closing the show today with half, uh, well, actually one-third of my interview with Rick Grinnell, which will be part of the interview podcast. My, I've got two podcasts. One is the Hugh Hewitt Show, Condensed, uh, highly concentrated Hugh Hewitt, and we put that up every day. We just cut out a lot of stuff, and we put up the interviews, and it's uh, the Hugh Hewitt Show, highly, uh, highly condensed, concentrated Hugh Hewitt. And then I've got the interview, which can range from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on who I'm talking to. Like, I, I got one out of the archives with the late Christopher Hitchens, Archbishop Chaput went up uh, on Friday. It's available now. Just go to Hugh Hewitt, Google Hugh Hewitt, the interview, iTunes, and it'll take you right there, or Spotify will take you right there. I got a note from Coach Hauser. He said I couldn't play back in the White House days on the White House golf team because the seal of the presidency was always in danger and I was defending it. And I did. But uh, when I talk about golf, I speak with the authority of Joe Biden. Here's Joe Biden in the Rose Garden yesterday, cut number five. Oh, uh, it's frozen. That's, that's unfortunate. And, you know, Dwayne came in and did the after show yesterday. I was doing, didn't tell me. Did not tell me that when the after show is on, I can't use my Zoom video. So I'm joining a class with Guy Benson and Megan McCain last night at Georgetown. And all I can do is get on audio because Dwayne has bogarted the video feed for the after show. And then he left and he's golfing this morning. And so we don't have a, uh, we, we still have a frozen, uh, uh, it, it, it's election integrity is what I'll tell you about during the break. If you head over to HughHewitt.com, and I really, this is important. I've had it with Major League Baseball, as you know, and Coca-Cola and Delta. They just lie about the Georgia law, which is the voting integrity law that was necessary in Georgia. They lie about it. Georgia Public Broadcasting has done the complete rundown on it. So I have put, posted at the top of HughHewitt.com, stand with Georgia, support election integrity, know the truth about the Georgia election law sign here. It's a petition, but it's a knowing petition. And it says, Major League Baseball, Delta, Coke, get informed about the law and change before customer customers just continue to fly away from your product. It goes for everyone else, who all the woke corporations that are blasting Georgia. But it's not just sign here and, and sign on. No, we I, I condense all of the key points about the Georgia law from the Georgia Public Broadcaster's summary of the law. So if you go to HughHewitt.com and you just go up to the top, you'll see support election integrity. Now you might say, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. That's a SalemNow.com film. Uh, that's a good thing, but that's not the top. Stand with Georgia is at the very top. Support election integrity, very top. You just gotta let it low and then sign on. I'd like everybody who listens to this show to send a message whether you are left, right, or center, that people ought to work with facts. Stacey Abrams is trying to run away from this. This, this boycott of Georgia is the most unpopular thing with Georgians of all political stripe. And they're blaming Raphael Warnick and Stacey Abrams for this nightmare. They lost $100 million. So uh, talking to Mayor Q of Kansas City yesterday, Kansas City got $200 million in the stimulus. The state of New York got $100 billion. San Francisco got $600 million. And Raphael Warnick uh, worked with uh, President Biden to cost Major League Baseball, cost Atlanta $100 billion from the, from the uh, cancellation of the All-Star Game and a boycott of other major companies because Raphael Warnick apparently hates Georgia and Biden hates Georgia. So I want to stand with Georgia. Head over there. But did you know that, New York? State got $100 billion. San Francisco got $600 million. Uh, Joe Biden's friends are very expensive. Very, very expensive. I, I hate to look and see what Ohio got. It probably got like $13 because Ohio is a deep red state now. Maybe Cleveland got some money. It's a Democratic city. Pittsburgh got no money at all. They, they did. Pittsburgh is like, they, they, what was that? Was that Pittsburgh burning? I don't know what that was. That was an interesting sound effect. When we come back, America, Sunny Bunch joins us. Um, meanwhile, you do not want to be named Matt Gates, and you do not want to ha be on his staff. He lost another staffer. Me thinks Jason Gates is going to be indicted over the weekend and be in jail before long. Don't go anywhere, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Don't forget to sign up for The Huniverse. All of Hugh's broadcasts on demand. The After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself. Dwayne FM and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. But for you youngins out there, at one time, there were poll taxes in the South. You had to pay money in order to vote. Well, black people were poor, therefore they couldn't come up with the money, couldn't vote. Literacy tests. Blacks were not taught to read and write. Well, you can't uh, pass a literacy tax, you can't. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. Former President Barack Obama has weighed in on the controversy regarding Major League Baseball and the Georgia law. And Obama has praised Major League Baseball's decision to pull the All-Star game out of Georgia. Once again, somebody who could have done something to calm the country has thrown gasoline on it he knows the georgia law does not say that you can't give water to somebody standing in line he knows that this law actually expanded the numbers of hours allotted for voting not fewer what obama could have said a statesman would have said i've read the georgia law and while certainly we ought to be concerned about the history of voter suppression in america There's nothing in this law that does anything but expand voter opportunities. Just as Senator Obama, when interviewed on 60 Minutes by Steve Croft, he was running and he was gaining on Hillary, but he wasn't the front runner yet. And Steve Croft said, Senator, if you don't get the nomination, will it be because of racism? To which Senator Obama said, no, it will be because I've not outline a vision trending now on the Larry Elder show former president Barack Obama has weighed in on the controversy regarding Major League Baseball and the Georgia law and Obama has praised Major League Baseball's decision to pull the all-star game out of Georgia once again Somebody who could have done something to calm the country has thrown gasoline on it. He knows the Georgia law does not say that you can't give water to somebody standing in line. He knows that this law actually expanded the numbers of hours allotted for voting, not fewer. What Obama could have said, a statesman would have said. I've read the Georgia law, and while certainly we ought to be concerned about the history of voter suppression in America, there's nothing in this law that does anything but expand voter opportunities. Just as Senator Obama, when interviewed on 60 Minutes by Steve Croft, he was running and he was gaining on Hillary, but he wasn't the front runner yet. And Steve Croft said, Senator, if you don't get the nomination, will it be because of racism? To which Senator Obama said, no, it will be because I've not outlined a vision that the American people can embrace. Man gets elected. The Cambridge police acted stupidly. There's a place called Ferguson. Invites Al Sharpton into the White House over 80 times. 
embraces the Black Lives Matter movement. Once again, making things worse. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Welcome back, America. That music means on the Hugh Hewitt Show that Sonny Bunch is back, the official movie theater movie critic of the Hugh Hewitt Show and, of course, streaming now that it's replaced the movies. And Sonny Bunch has been uh, very patient during the shutdown. He has not demanded any increase in airline miles, so we appreciate that. Sonny, I saw two movies since last we saw, talked in the theater as I'm vaccinated. I've seen nobody in Godzilla vs. Kong. It's wonderful. The movies are back. I have also seen uh, Nobody in Godzilla vs. Kong, and I saw Godzilla vs. Kong both in theaters and on HBO Max, uh, Hugh. And let me let me tell you, it's, it's a big difference. It's a big Huge. Difference seeing that movie uh, at home on a t- – and look, I have a very nice TV with a decent enough sound system, you know. Um, and seeing that movie in a theater with a really good sound system and a, and a, and on a very big screen is just a, it's just a huge difference because the thing about Godzilla versus Kong is look you're not watching it for the plot right you're not you're not uh, going to this for the plot? story there's you're no not, plot you're not, <laughs> you're not watching it to see you know how the humans kind of communicate with Godzilla and Kong and how they're trying to change the world and you know get them get them to get no you want to see the big monkey and the big lizard punch each other that's yep. all you want and you want to see it on as big a screen uh with with as with as deep a bass and as rumbling a sound system uh as you possibly can so this is you know and it's and it's obvious that there's a se- segment of viewers who have been waiting for exactly a, a movie like this right i mean because if you look at the box office numbers, this movie grossed almost as much money in its first five days as Tenet did in its whole run. I mean, it's it's not quite there; it's it's close, but it it you know there's there is a group of there's a group of people who have been waiting, who have been dying to get back to a big dumb movie to see on a big giant screen. And, uh, and you and know what, is, Sonny? It doesn't even matter. If King Kong were three times the size, we all know in our heads, intellectually, that the big blue stuff that comes out of Godzilla when he's mad would take him out and put a hole in his chest, right? We all know that. But somehow we suspend disbelief and believe it could be a battle and just punching that somehow you'll get around the big blue stuff that comes out of, of Godzilla. We all went and everybody was happy. They're still doing social distancing and I'm kind of at the stage being vaccinated. I'm wondering why, uh, because I wouldn't go to a theater if I wasn't vaccinated, but the, the vaccinated crowd, I mean, we got 109 million people vaccinated. The movies are back. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, a, it's tricky because the, the people who aren't vaccinated are generally the people who are uh, younger and therefore at, at much less risk of, of catching a very serious case of COVID. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, I understand the desire to keep people socially distanced just because they need to get people back into the, the theaters and they want them to be as comfortable as possible. Um, so I, I, I get that on a certain level. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely getting to the point where uh, soon, hopefully, soon, we'll have enough people vaccinated, and we'll have we'll we'll be close enough to herd immunity that we we won't need the social distancing, 
uh, and hopefully the mask requirement will be gone soon as well because there's, you know, for the, for the glass. For the now, S- Sonny, I got to ask you, I went you to see... I. I went to see the the movie Nobody just because it was a movie and I hadn't seen it before and I didn't realize who the lead was. I kept thinking to myself, where do I know this guy from? Where do I know this guy from? Finally, I realized it's better call Saul from Breaking Bad. And it took me a long time because Breaking Bad's a long time ago. Last year, I watched the last episode of it. Uh, I got to re-watch the last six when I get back to Virginia. What'd you think of uh, Nobody? Uh, I I liked Nobody Okay for the first half. Uh, so Nobody stars Bob Odenkirk, as you mentioned, uh, as a John Wick-style killer. He's a, he's one of the best killers out there. He's really good. Uh, and he's trying to have a, a normal family home life. Um, and, and the first uh, 45 minutes, it's a very short movie. It's only 90 minutes long, uh, which is good. It's to, That's to its benefit. And the first, the first 45 minutes or so, uh, you see this guy, his name is Hutch. He is... Uh, you know, kind of a beaten down suburban dad. He's, he, his, his life is not great. You know, he is, he's just kind of blah. Um, and then he, something, something bad happens to him. Uh, there's a home invasion and it, it sparks, it sparks something inside of him. It makes him remember who he was and who he was, was one of the best killers in the world. You know, can't be stopped. You know, nobody can nobody can beat him. Blah blah blah. No superpowers, like, just big guns. No superpowers, just very good with the hands and fists and guns and bombs. Um, and the first forty five minutes again, I, I really really liked, and I thought it did a very good job of kind of putting us in his headspace. There's a there's a fight at the end of this sequence on a bus that is very very well done. Uh, that uses kind of the geography of the bus to to. Uh, contain and limit the fight, which is always good. I, I like it when things, I like it when fights of this sort take place in a uh, kind of confined, limited area because it changes the whole geography of how the actual fight works. Uh, you, you, in a, for a humorous example of this, remember uh, Raising Arizona, the uh, Coen Brothers movie, which has a fantastic fight that takes place entirely in a, a trailer more or less and you know guys are like scraping their knuckles on the ceiling and they're uh they're being being shoved into toilets through paper thin walls it's very funny uh but and this is kind of in that vein it's also funny but it's also very very you know hard and brutal and uh, the bad guys are good bad guys they're russian mob bad guys but i gotta ask you about the one thing i didn't like the sequence which gets a little home alone-ish where, he, you know, he's, he's organized spears from, uh, the, uh, you know, guys with machine guns don't normally fall prey to spears. Yeah, we're t- the, the scene at the end. The, the, the warehouse scene. In the, in, yeah. in the warehouse. Yeah, I mean, this is, and this is my problem with the movie. Is I, I wasn't as enamored with the bad guys uh, as you, Hugh. I, I, did not, I did not think they were that good. They, we've seen the kind of, like, weird, kooky Russian thing before. And there, there wasn't anything that new or interesting here. And and my my big problem is it just gets very silly at the end. Kind of a, as you're hinting at here, you know the the uh, last few few minutes, last twenty minutes or so, uh, Hutch Bob Odenkirk is joined by Christopher Lloyd, who plays his father in the film, and another actor who I won't name just to try and avoid the surprise. Um, but they, they, he's joined by his, his father and brother, and they, and they go to war with the Russian mob in this machinery plant, machinist plant, machining plant, whatever it is. And uh, I, I can just suspend a lot of disbelief. I can, I can watch the giant monkey punch the giant lizard, right, and more or less believe it. But when I, when I watch Christopher Lloyd, who's 82 now, this is no fault of his own. When I watch Christopher Lloyd, who is 82, kind of hobble around the machinist plant, the mach- you know, whatever, whatever kind of plant that was, with a shotgun, avoiding being murdered by, like, you know, legions of 30-year-old, really fit stunt guys, um, I didn't buy it. I didn't buy it. And, and the problem with this, it's a very specific problem, is that you already have to suspend a fair amount of disbelief to buy Bob Odenkirk doing this, right? He is he is not an action star. You you watch him and you're like, okay, well, can he do this? And he does a good job. He, he got in really good shape. He did a lot of training, a lot of fight training and that sort of stuff for this. But then Christopher Lloyd comes in and he is just as effective as Bob Odenkirk is. And you're like, well, now, now I feel silly for believing in Bob Odenkirk, it's hundred percent. Christopher Lloyd was like Robert Redford in the uh, in the '60s radical movie 
when you hit 80, you can't do action movies. It's just the reality. You can't. Yeah. You can be bad guys. You can sit around and scheme. You can be Dr. Evil, but you yeah. can't really get in the fight. And there's a great there's a there's a great scene with Christopher Lloyd earlier where he takes out a bad guy sitting in his easy chair. And yes. He's like, okay, I buy this. I buy this. This actually that actually works. And in comparison with the final sequence, you know, it just it just it was a, it, the the last half of the movie, the whole last half of the movie was kind of a disappointment to me. Um, and that's that's a problem. That's a problem. When, when, so what do we uh, have coming up? Is there anything to, now that I'm back in the habit? It's like I, you know I shouldn't make fun of pe people relapsing on addiction, but I have relapsed to the movies. I need my movies. What's up? Yeah, we're definitely uh, we're definitely going to hit a lull here for a little bit because a lot of the studios push stuff back. I think the next big thing in theaters is I don't think this is going to be a big Q movie, Q, uh, but Mortal Kombat. Uh, Mortal Kombat is... Oh, I, I've, I've pledged to my boys back. to go with them. I've pledged. Okay, I'm, so, I am indentured. I have to go, even though I didn't see so it that, play it for a minute. Uh, and look, here's the... Uh, there, there's still stuff to watch at home. You know, this week I watched uh, I watched The Father, which was nominated for Best Picture. It stars Anthony Hopkins as a as a... Uh, an elderly father with dementia who is is his his daughter who is played by Olivia Coleman is looking to put him in a nursing home um and i like that movie a lot it's probably my favorite of the best picture nominees uh, it does a very very good job of of portraying what it must be like to have dementia and be constantly confused to be you know unable to recognize your own daughter to be unsure of where you're living to be unsure of the people who are taking care of you um it, it, it in a way it's almost a horror movie because it's, it's that terrifying but it's also it's also kind of funny and uh i don't sweet isn't the right word word exactly but it is it is emotional and uh you know kind of kind of hard to watch if you if you have family members who have gone through this um but it's very very good i mean it's got anthony hopkins and olivia coleman are, are great uh, actors and actresses. Uh, I, I I loved it uh, a lot. I would say it's actually my favorite of the Best Picture nominees. So that's that's playing. It's playing in a few theaters. You might be able to find it near you, but it's it's easier to watch uh, at home on video on demand. All right, but mostly it's a Masters weekend, Sunny Bunch. So TV wins anyway. Sunny Bunch. Follow them on Twitter, and it's across the aisle. I always get it wrong. What's the name of the podcast? Across the movie aisle on the uh, on the look it up on Apple you'll find it there. Uh, iTunes, we'll Spotify, across the movie aisle. I will get it right one of these years. Sunny bunch, thank you. Your your airline miles are in the mail. Uh, just check the mail because they're always in the mail. Time for me to do my relieffactor.com reminder on Friday. If you're going to be a weekend warrior, I did my six yesterday. Feel great. Why? This little package in my hand, relieffactor.com, every week, every single day at this time. Not on Saturday and Sunday. I take it at a different time on Saturday and Sunday. But every day at this time on the air, down go the four pills. And, of course, we have to have the lukewarm coffee. Whenever I say that, Coach Meyer likes the lukewarm coffee bit. And uh, I know he's not listening. He's busy plotting the draft. He probably had not slept in weeks, so he probably is not listening to anything. But I am telling you, I am telling you right now that relieffactor.com, maybe we can arrange for the Jacksonville Jaguars to have giant bowls of it in the locker room because there's nothing uh, untoward about it. It is all helpful. It, it works. Those guys get banged up. My, uh, my ART therapist on the West Coast is, is the Chargers ART therapist. And everybody gets banged up in football, so they need Relief Factor. And uh, they need it now. So we ought to just distribute it to all 31 professional football teams and maybe even the Steelers. Not too sure about the Steelers. Maybe we ought to do that. I um, had a conversation yesterday with Mayor Q, Quentin Lucas of Kansas City, in denial about the Browns getting jobbed in the uh, playoff game with the Chiefs. So I don't think we're going to send it to the Chiefs either until uh, Mayor Q comes clean about the fact that Rashard Higgins was speared at the end of the first half and the fumble through the end zone was illegal and the Browns should have gotten the ball back. But I don't carry a grudge at all, do I, America? Coming right back, 1-800-520-1234, 1-800-520-1234. We have unplugged our uh, broken audio, so you'll be hearing Joe Biden on guns, which is like hearing me on golf. 
Uh, we are both as knowledgeable, but first, Tarzana Joe, right after the break, don't go anywhere, America. It is the Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Birch Gold Group. Trending now on the Charlie Kirk Show. On this program, and I encourage you all to check out our podcast, we talk, of course, about how Major League Baseball requires an identification when you go to will call tickets. Good luck going to Wrigley Field and saying, hey, I'm here. Give me my tickets. I'm going to say, sir, we're going to need some identification. Well, according to the Major League Baseball catechism, according to Major League Baseball's new social teaching, according to Major League Baseball's school of ethics, that's racist. Yet Major League Baseball will require identification for all their employees and identification for anyone that goes to pick up tickets or even to go into one of their luxurious boxes at some of the nicest Major League Baseball stadiums across the country. If Major League Baseball actually believed that Georgia was engaging in Jim Crow on steroids, like Joe Biden said, then they would have canceled all 82 games of the upcoming Major League Baseball season in Georgia. But the Braves still have home games. So what's really going on here? It's so obvious, and yet very few people are talking about it. The goal by the activist groups was to inflict pain on Georgia and Brian Kemp and to send a message to Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Arizona. If you try to reform your elections, you're going to feel a wrath. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. Wait a minute. Did, did Senator Cotton say that the state of Delaware has fewer drop boxes than Georgia? What? Did, did Tom Cotton just say that Georgia, that, that, that Delaware rather, doesn't have any early voting at all? What? Yeah, I mean, nothing like a few facts to get in the way of a narrative of lies. And it is a narrative of lies. Biden was asked, well, since baseball moved the All-Star game out of Georgia, should they move the Masters golf tournament out of Georgia as well? It is reassuring to see that uh, for-profit operations and businesses are speaking up about how these new Jim Crow laws are just antithetical to who we are. There's another side to it, too. The other side to it, too, is when they, in fact, move out of Georgia. Joined now by the poet laureate of the Hugh Hewitt Show, Tarzana Joe. Hello, Joe. Hello, Hugh. You know, I think baseball is the story this week. But instead of rhyming Manfred with brain dead or something like that, I, I wrote a lyric, which I hope you'll like, and I promised not to sing. But it's about why things are really important in the game of baseball. I wrote this little story so everyone could see, through all the years and all the cheers, what baseball means to me. If I did all my homework and played nice with the boys, didn't aggravate my sisters and put away my toys. If I did only good things and didn't do nothing bad, I got to stay up late all the way till eight and listen to Vin Scully with my dad. Sitting there beside him cheering for the team, one day he would cheer for me. Oh well, a boy can dream. If I read all my lessons and didn't slam any doors, 
if I ate all the broccoli and handled all my chores, if I said please and thank you and didn't get Mama mad, I got to stay up late, all the way till eight, and listen to Vin Scully with my dad. I had a lot of real good times, but the best I ever had was when both of us were men, and I stayed up till ten to listen to Vin Scully with my dad. He told us all those stories and things the players did. I didn't get to the major leagues, but most nights with my kid. If he said please and thank you and had his homework done, we got to stay up late, all the way to late. I listened to Vin Scully with my son. That's what baseball means to me by Tarzana Joe. That is terrific, Joe. I wish Rob Manfred would hear that. Maybe we'll post that and send it to him. Uh, we have over at HughHewitt.com a petition about that. You're right. And I, I, we have already posted at the interview with the interview with Vin Scully at the beginning of the season, one of my finest hours on the radio because I didn't say anything and he said everything. <laughs> uh, so that was, you know, that was really the tops. Joe, that is marvelous. Marvelous. That will be posted at TarzanaJoe.com. It sure will be. Thank you. And are you buried in commission work? Yesterday, I set a record for commission requests, and I already got one this morning. So, poetry business, it's a V-shaped recovery. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com for all your poetry needs for weddings and funerals and everything in between. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, you. Uh, I mentioned a Joe over at HughHewitt.com. Let it load. Make sure you scroll to the very top. Stand with Georgia. Support election integrity. Hit that, read the facts, sign the petition. Maybe Rob Manfred will be ex-commissioner Rob Manfred before long. I mean, really hurt all of baseball. Hurt every baseball fan for virtue signaling. And I keep looking for him in Augusta to which he belongs in the state that he is boycotting to see if he's resigned from Augusta yet. His, his impulsive personal animus and democratic leanings led him to politicize a sport that ought not to be politicized. Stand with Georgia. Support election and integrity. That's over at HughHewitt.com. I also mentioned the podcast, The Interview. And I'm looking at it right now. It's got uh, 28 reviews and a 4.9 star rating. And I'll tell you why. I'm not bad at interviews. Actually, I'm pretty good at interviews. I've done about, I, I use routinely the number 25,000 in a career that began in 1990. Uh, that doesn't count callers. And it doesn't call interactions with Dwayne, which is more like getting hit with a brick. But it's interviews. I mean, serious interviews. Let's start with done Archbishop Charles Chaput, Vin Scully, as I mentioned, with, uh, with Tarzana Joe, Alex Berenson, Josh Rogan, Dr. Fauci, Amy Parnes, and, uh, and uh, John Allen, and all the way back. And I pull one out of the archives every now and then, like Christopher Hitchens, my last interview with him, which went an hour and 40 minutes long. He died shortly thereafter, and uh, my interview with him and Dr. Mark Roberts will go up next week. I just pull one out of the archives, but the uh, the interview is doing very, very well because it's the kind of podcast people love. Not the same voice all the time. I'm on everyone, and I'm I do what I do best, which is interview. And uh, you hear people spoken to respectfully and at length about what they know, and that's why the interview works. And if you want the rundown, you get the rundown, or you can get highly concentrated Hugh Hewitt in the podcast where I take you through the three-hour show in about 45 minutes hitting the highlights. And every minute of the Hugh Hewitt show is a highlight. I mean, let's just be honest. Every minute is a highlight, except when I talk about golf, which is like Joe Biden talking about uh, the AFT. In fact, he should be calling it the ATF, but he repeatedly calls it the AFT. Here's Joe in the Rose Garden yesterday, cut number five. Finally. The Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the key agency enforcing gun laws, hasn't had a permanent director since 2015. Today, I'm proud to nominate David Chipman to serve as a director of the AFT. David knows the AFT well. Yeah, the AFT is not actually the AFT. It's the ATF. Ah, oh, Joe, what are we going to do? Four years of this. Uh, pray for him. That's what we do for presidents. Pray for him every day. Don't go anywhere, America. Hour number two. We begin the Hillsdale Dialogue early, but not before I get to tell you more about the day's news, the late breaking stories, breaking news always. Remember that 
Petition to stand with Georgia over at HughHewitt.com. Go right now, sign it, be a part of the blowback that Rob Manfred and Major League Baseball, Coca-Cola, and Delta deserve. It is the Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. If you fly United, this is about you. Our flight deck. Now, who's in the flight deck? Is it the people who serve the pretzels? No. It's the people who fly the plane. Especially after 9-11, the door is locked before the plane even taxis off the jetway. Our flight deck should reflect the diverse group of people on board our planes every day. No, it shouldn't. I don't want a screaming toddler on the flight deck. I don't want somebody who's 400 pounds and sweating next to me and hogging the armrests on the flight deck. I'd like people who know how to fly the plane. But United says, that's why we plan for 50% of our pilots in the next decade to be women. Or people of color. Hang on, you you discriminatory bigots. Why not one-legged people? Why not double amputees? Shouldn't they be allowed to fly our plane? What about bl blind people? Should we not have blind people fly our planes, United? You bigots. It's out of control. You have one job to do and one job to alone to get us safely to our destinations professionally period end of story now if you want to do it economically then you'll have an advantage if you cut corners on safety requirements on training you will pay the penalty keep up with what's trending subscribe on youtube today Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. But for you youngins out there, at one time, there were poll taxes in the South. You had to pay money in order to vote. Well, black people were poor, therefore they couldn't come up with the money, couldn't vote. Literacy tests. Blacks were not taught to read and write. Well, you can't uh, pass a literacy tax, you can't vote. Grandfather clauses. If your grandfather could vote, you could vote. Well, black people's grandfathers couldn't vote, so therefore they couldn't vote. That's what used to happen. But having to produce ID, having to verify who you are, that's worse than literacy tests, worse than poll taxes, worse than the grandfather clause. How insulting is that? And nobody says anything. One of these Biden administrators, Biden himself will say this, nobody says anything. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, my, my parents grew up in the South, and, and they told me stories about how black people were required to come up with a poll tax in order to vote, how black people were required to pass literacy tests, uh, and, and how black people were subjected to what's called the grandfather clause, where they could only vote if their grandparents could vote. And you're, you're comparing the Georgia law, which all it does is say that you have to verify who you are, and the majority of black people support photo voter ID? You're comparing it to that? Isn't that kind of insulting? Insulting to people who went through that? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You know, I'm watching the Derek Chauvin trial. And Yamish Alcindor, one of the left-wing so-called reporters, she said that the Chauvin trial is not just about whether Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. No, 
It's about voting rights. It's about whether blacks in America will be treated fairly. I'm paraphrasing. I'll play the exact quote later on in the show. So to Miss Alcindor, who I know listens to my show every day, in the event that this trial has a result that you don't like, is it possible, just possible, that maybe, just maybe, a juror or more than one juror saw this trial differently? Is it just possible that one juror may feel that the death of George Floyd was because of his drugs and the fentanyl in his system, as opposed to the knee being a substantial cause? Is it possible that one juror may see it that way or more than one? And if so, are you going to consider this to be a miscarriage of justice? Or is it possible, just possible, that the juror or more than one juror may see it differently? Again, we ought to be looking for justice, not vengeance. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. So Atlanta is 52% black. The All-Star Game would have represented a $100 million economic stimulus to black-owned businesses, and thousands of black Americans would have been employed working in the All-Star Game or working in the activities around there. Instead, to try and protest racial injustice, Major League Baseball pulls the All-Star Game to go to one of the whitest metropolitan areas in the country, Denver, which is 10% black. So let me get this straight. To fight systemic racism, you pull an economic stimulus out of black-run businesses and communities into young, white, upper-middle-class communities in the mountains. That's your idea of fighting systemic racism and injustice? No, there's something else happening here. Of course, that wasn't their intention, and it's important to point that out because it actually does the opposite of what they say they're going to do, but there's something deeper happening here. On this program, and I encourage you all to check out our podcast, we talk, of course, about how Major League Baseball requires an identification when you go to will call tickets. Good luck going to Wrigley Field and saying, hey, I'm here. Give me my tickets. They're going to say, sir, we're going to need some identification. Well, according to the Major League Baseball catechism, according to Major League Baseball's new social teaching, according to Major League Baseball's school of ethics, that's racist. Yet Major League Baseball will require identification for all their employees and identification for anyone that goes to pick up tickets. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. This is pretty significant. More Americans support Georgia's new voter integrity law than oppose it. This is a morning consult poll just released. Despite Biden and Koch and Delta and Major League Baseball, despite all of that, this new poll shows 42% of Americans are more likely to support the law, 36% are likely to oppose it. Now, you may not consider that very significant, but it is. And the reason it's significant is to, to know that more Americans, despite Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Good Friday to you. Coming up at the bottom of this hour, we start the Hilltail Dialogue early this week because at the bottom of next hour, Ambassador Richard Grinnell. Um, I didn't hear you, Adam. Oh, my gosh. Prince Philip has died. One of the great breaking news. That's why we're always live on the Hugh Hewitt Show. 
One of the great men of the last century, and indeed this century, Prince Philip has seen it all. Uh, our prayers and thoughts to the royal family, especially Queen Elizabeth, whose life partner has steady uh, been at her side, steady since her accession to the crown all those decades ago. Uh, so uh, that's sad news to hear. Thank you, Adam, for passing along breaking news. We always bring you breaking news on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Always. Prince Philip dead. I, uh, I want you also to know over at HughHewitt.com, the Stand with Georgia petition is at the very top. That's breaking news. Now, one of the breaking news story, and please go and sign it. We just got a message, Major League Baseball, that Rob Manfred really ought to be fired after he resigns from Augusta and after he apologizes for politicizing baseball on bad facts. He just got it all wrong. He got everything wrong. He hadn't read the bill. He had talked to his woke staff. And he and Delton Koch got everything wrong, and they threw themselves in the middle of a controversy, and Republicans are not backing down. They, they have the right, you know, Koch has the right to be wrong, uh, and, and every corporation has the right to be wrong, and customers have a right to say, when you're that wrong and you don't apologize, I'm not going to buy tickets to your games or drink your Coke or fly Delta, because you're wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Come out and debate someone about it. You'll just be embarrassed. Rob Manfred would embarrass the country and baseball if he came out and talked politics. He doesn't know anything. He knows about as much about politics and voting integrity as I know about the strike zone and splitters, curves, and what the pitcher is throwing. I watch the game, right? But I do not know the game. Now, I do know one thing. Another big story is Matt Gates. I haven't said much except the headlines because until someone's indicted, I don't really take it seriously. And given the news hatred of Republicans, their attempt by CBS 60 Minutes to take out Ron DeSantis, and they're lying about it ever since. There was a hit job. Everyone knows there was a hit job. Ron DeSantis crushed them. Ever since that, and I just know what the media does to Republicans. So I am slow to pick up this man or this woman did this awful thing. But I've been following the Matt Gates story and... Let me just say this, if he's indicted, he ought to be run out of town on a rail. If he's indicted on having sex with a minor, if he's indicted on child trafficking, if he's indicted on uh, the Mann Act, I don't care what he's indicted on, the salaciousness of this story, the indifference to the suffering of, of girls being trafficked and in prostitution and human bondage, the, the, the sleaziness of it, he ought to be out of town if it's true. Now, I don't know if it's true. He hasn't been indicted yet. Could all be made up. 60 Minutes might be behind it. But I do know that the attorney for Joel Greenberg, who's also accused of being a slime bag along with Matt Gates, uh, gave a presser yesterday. Cut number 12. Did, 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 did your client introduce Matt Gates to any underage girls for sexual relations? All right. So I'm just going to let you sit down there and so I can look over your head and ignore that question. <laughs> I apologize. I, I just can't answer that question. I wasn't okay. What, <laughs> that was that was a little devious. You're hiding down there below, and then you, you zing that at me. You know. So uh, this is the attorney for Fritz Scheller, and you really ought to be watching on YouTube because he's one of these attorneys who hadn't had a haircut in a hundred years. And there's a whole brand of attorneys that believe in never getting a haircut. They think it's cool. Uh, they think they're a, a character in a Chuck Box novel. Judge, the judge in Chuck Bo Box novels would throw him out of court. His name is Fritz Scheller. But then he goes on to talk about Matt Gates, cut number 13. Do you know the does, does Matt Gates have anything to worry about? Does Matt Gates? That is such a... <laughs> um, does when he it have comes to, to what happened today in court. Does he uh, have anything to worry about? And you're asking me to get into the mind of Matt Gates, right? And uh, well, from your mind, from my mind, based on what your client knows, based on what my client knows. Okay. What does that mean? See, I thought if I kept on talking and talking, <laughs> I would avoid these questions, <laughs> and and not to say, um, I'm sure Matt Gates is not feeling very comfortable today. All right. Is that okay? Now let me let me comment. The, the takeaway is Matt Gates is not feeling very comfortable today. Of course not. But this guy is an idiot. He really is. His name is Fritz Scheller. He has clearly never had a case which involved the media before because he doesn't know how to act. And he's laughing and joking and trying to appear as wise. And he's got a, a face mask on, which is fine. 
But with the hair, he looks like a moron and he sounds like a moron. Uh, but then he does try and explain a legal point. Cut number 14. Can you say, is, does Joel uh, consider Matt Gates a friend or has he cut ties? Um, I, think, I think the media has covered their relationship pretty well. Um, I can say that uh, in any case I have, if there's other um, potential co-defendants or, or, you know, I uh, preclude my clients from talking to them. So he won't look at any. I, I really wish you could watch the video. He's also got the chin hair thing going. I would guess he's about 55 or 60 and he's not grown up. He's a Peter Pan lawyer uh, and, and not a professional look. And he's uh, bobbing and weaving. He's saying, just with other cases, I advise people not to talk to potential co-defendants. That's just, that's common sense lawyering. But it's also, there's no reason for him to talk to the media, except he's looking for clients. All right, that's what I think. Uh, I can do my chin wagging. Whenever I see a, a lawyer who's talking to the media without a clear message and just taking random questions, he's a bad lawyer uh, because you never take random questions from the media when you've got one of your people in the clink or go into the clink and his buddy Joel Greenberg is supposedly going to plead his client. And then he, he concludes this way. Again, it's Fritz Scheller. He's the attorney for Joel Greenberg, the associate of Matt Gates. Uh, slime ball extraordinaire, if anything is true, that's been written, written about him. And here's Fritz Scheller, cut number 15. I don't even talk about this case with my wife. And in fact, I know some of you all tried to reach me through her. And do you know how uncomfortable it was? Taking in mind that I don't talk to her about the case, she said, I got this call about you, a congressman, and underage girls. And so I had a lot of explaining to do. Yeah, that's not really funny. There's a professional duty here. As a lawyer, I just, it's not funny to make expenses at your client's co defendant because that might make the co defendant mad. It also assumes facts not in evidence that he's saying, I'm getting calls about underage girls and uh, a congressman. Okay, that, that just bends the media narrative. Uh, it, it, and I, I think Matt Gates is going to be indicted. And if he is, guilty, 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 get him out of there. But we don't know that, and the attorney should shut up. Meanwhile, this will reassure you that Kamala Harris, the vice president who's in charge of the border, uh, came out and said this yesterday, cut number 10. Over the course of my career, I have seen gun violence up close. I've looked at autopsy photographs. I've seen with my own two eyes what a bullet can do to the human body. I've held hands with the hands of parents who have lost a child. I have seen children who were traumatized by the loss of a parent or sibling. And I have fought my entire career to end this violence and to pass reasonable gun safety laws. Time and again, as progress has stalled, we've all asked, what are we waiting for? Because we aren't waiting for a tragedy, I know that. We've had more tragedy than we can bear. We aren't waiting for solutions either, because the solutions exist. They already exist. People on both sides of the aisle want action. Real people on both sides of the aisle want action. So all that is left is the will and the courage to act. And President Joe Biden has the will and the courage to act. Now, you know, I, I, it's all just mumbo jumbo until you tell me what you want to do. Just tell me what you want to do and then we can debate it without the courage and the will to act nonsense. She simply is not very good at this yet. She was very good at it in California. That's not very good. Repeating the breaking news, Prince Philip, age 99, lifelong companion and husband of Queen Elizabeth has passed away at the age of 99. Great Britain will be in mourning as will the world will be saluting Prince Philip in his service to his uh, monarch and his wife and to his country for, I mean, decades and decades and decades, back to the 50s, Prince Philip dead at the age of 99. I will be right back, America. Stay tuned to The Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of The Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Birch Gold Group.
Sports. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. The calculation of Coca-Cola, the horrors of Coca-Cola, because th- this is not conviction. They didn't even read the law. <laughs> okay, let's be honest. They fear the left more than they fear us. It's That's all it amounts to. You know what this is? The left is is like the mafia. It's protection money. That's all it is. I'll pay off the left, and then things will be quiet. It's protection money. So we have to tell them you're not uh, you're not protected from the good guys. No more Coca Cola, and bye bye Major League Baseball, which is very painful for fans. I, I'm, I love the sport, but I'm not a big fan. My producer has been in baseball fantasy league for decades. Sometimes he wins. He's, he knows baseball so so well. So Sean, Sean, the same thing. Sean has taken up polo. It's a fascinating sport. Lacrosse. You know, I finally watched the lacrosse game because I met a, I met a girl, daughter of some donor, who played plays lacrosse. The problem is that watching the game on TV, I never saw the ball. Now, I see the puck perfectly in a hockey game. It's black on white. Am I the only one? Do you have to train your eye? Have you ever watched a lacrosse game? That's a great sport. But it's, it's problematic on TV. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. You know, I'm watching the Derek Chauvin trial. And Yamish Alcindor, one of the left-wing so-called reporters, she said that the Chauvin trial is not just about whether Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. No, it's about voting rights. It's about whether blacks in America will be treated fairly. I'm paraphrasing. I'm play the exact quote later on in the show. So to Miss Alcindor, who I know listens to my show every day. In the event that this trial has a result that you don't like, is it possible, just possible, that maybe, just maybe, a juror or more than one juror saw this trial differently? Is it just possible that one juror may feel that the death of George Floyd was because of his drugs and the fentanyl in his system as opposed to the knee being a substantial cause? Is it possible that one juror may see it that way or more than one? And if so, are you going to consider this to be a miscarriage of justice? Or is it possible, just possible, that the juror or more than one juror may see it differently? Again, we ought to be looking for justice, not vengeance. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today.
Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. The breaking news that will lead to 10 days of mourning in Great Britain is that Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Consort to the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, died this morning at the age of 99. He was the longest serving consort to a monarch in British history, which is saying a lot. But that's a lot of history. Uh, I'm reading from the British newspaper, The Telegraph. The Duke of Edinburgh, the longest serving consort to a monarch in British history, has died at the age of 99, Buckingham Palace has announced. Prince Philip, whom the Queen described as her strength and stay during her record-breaking reign, passed away at Windsor Castle on Friday. The palace said in a statement, It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. The royal family joined with people around the world in mourning his loss. The Duke was last seen in public on March 16th as he left the private King Edward VII Hospital, where he had been recuperating following heart surgery at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, a leading cardiac unit. He'd been admitted to the hospital on February 16th for rest and observation after feeling unwell. But that stay was extended and the palace later revealed he was being treated for an infection. After 13 nights, he was transferred to St. Bartholomew's for specialist cardiac treatment. Royal AIDS revealed on March 30 underwent a successful procedure for a pre-existing heart condition. He was carefully shielded as he left the King Edward VII Hospital in a wheelchair and was helped into a car for the 27-mile trip to Windsor Castle, where he was reunited with the Queen following 28 nights as an inpatient, his longest ever hospital stay. Previously, the Duke was last seen in public in July 2020 when, despite his advanced age, he briefly returned to royal duties to hand over his role as Colonel-in-Chief of the Rifles. The Duke left strict isolation at Windsor Castle to be honored by one of his oldest military ties after 67 years of service, accepting thanks and touching good wishes of the fair winds and following seas. He also pictured at uh, Princess Beatrice's wedding that month, photographed alongside the Queen for his 99th birthday in June. Last November marked the release of his last official photograph when the Duke was pictured sitting alongside the Queen at Windsor Castle. They admired a homemade card made by their great-granddaughter, Prince George, uh, great-grandchildren, Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis, ahead of their 73rd wedding anniversary. Since March 2020, the Duke has lived largely in strict isolation of Windsor as a lockdown precaution against COVID-19. It was a welcome silver lining of the pandemic that allowed the Duke and Her Majesty to spend these last few months together enjoying each other's company for more time than they otherwise would have managed. Uh, it is a, a remarkable life. The funeral will be a royal ceremonial funeral expected to be taken place in 10 days' time. No further details have been released. It's codenamed Operation Fourth Bridge by the royal household. However, palace insiders have said the Duke specified he wanted a low-key funeral at St. George's Chapel at Windsor um, Castle. Uh, in 2016, he carried out official meetings and visits on 110 days of the year. I mean, he's been doing this for decades and decades and decades and decades. And really quite an amazing record uh, of an action path life. He was an incredibly active man who enjoyed good health for much of his life, according to the Telegraph. In his later years, he was a regular at the Royal Windsor Horse Show, defied his age to enjoy his hobby of carriage driving in local parks. Uh, the Duke's death will hold funeral fond recollections of his most memorable moments, including his most amusing gaffes over the years. When asked about his reputation for not suffering fools gladly, he once grinned and replied, I have suffered fools with patience. And you're going to see a lot of, of a man because when he was young, he captured the hearts of everyone who was young. Tall and athletic with the looks of a Viking god, Philip at 17, uh, came into the, to the attention of royal life. And from that for time forward to 99, so for 82 years or 72 years, 82 years, oh my gosh, 82 years of public life, that would wear anyone down. Well, Godspeed, Prince Philip, you did your job. And that is something when you were royal, you did your job. I'll be right back, America, stay tuned.
Don't forget to sign up for The Huniverse. All of Hugh's broadcasts on demand, The After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself, Dwayne FM, and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. These are difficult decisions. Do you want to listen to the medical profession? Do you want to listen to professional counselors? Do you want to listen to parents? Or do you want to leave all these decisions to uh, the legislators that come from all different kinds of background? Yes, they're elected to represent you, but they do not necessarily make the right judgments for parents and for doctors in the most sensitive issues. Did you hear what he said at the end? It's fascinating. Do you want to listen to the medical professionals, what, what like Dr. Fauci, that kind of medical professional, as opposed to, you know, the decisions of a legislature where people come from various backgrounds? Oh, what are those backgrounds that are problematic, Governor Hutchinson? Are they too white or are they too heterosexual? Are they cisgender normative heterosexual? Is that why in this one issue, they shouldn't be allowed to represent the people of Arkansas who elected them? No, 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 no. We can protect children from sex, from incest, from drugs, from alcohol, from pederasty, no, but when it comes to lopping off their sexual organs and filling them with chemicals to create a hormonal imbalance that they're not supposed to have naturally, well, let's forget the protections that we provide them on all of those other issues. You are a fake conservative. And if you listen to his answers, he's not a very smart person either. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Former President Barack Obama has weighed in on the controversy regarding Major League Baseball and the Georgia law. And Obama has praised Major League Baseball's decision to pull the All-Star game out of Georgia. Once again, somebody who could have done something to calm the country has thrown gasoline on it. He knows the Georgia law does not say that you can't give water to somebody standing in line. He knows that this law actually expanded the numbers of hours allotted for voting, not fewer. What Obama could have said, a statesman would have said, I've read the Georgia law, and while certainly we ought to be concerned about the history of voter suppression in America, there's nothing in this law that does anything but expand voter opportunities. Just as Senator Obama, when interviewed on 60 Minutes by Steve Croft, he was running and he was gaining on Hillary, but he wasn't the front runner yet. And Steve Croft said, Senator, if you don't get the nomination, will it be because of racism? To which Senator Obama said, no, it will be because I've not outlined a vision that the American people can embrace. Man gets elected. The Cambridge police acted stupidly. There's a place called Ferguson. Invites Al Sharpton into the White House over 80 times. Embraces the Black Lives Matter movement. Once again making things worse. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. On this program, and I encourage you all to check out our podcast, we talk, of course, about how Major League Baseball requires an identification when you go to will call tickets. Good luck going to Wrigley Field and saying, hey, I'm here. Give me my tickets. They're going to say, sir, we're going to need some identification. Well, according to the Major League Baseball catechism, 
according to Major League Baseball's new social teaching, according to Major League Baseball's school of ethics, that's racist. Yet Major League Baseball will require identification for all their employees and identification for anyone that goes to pick up tickets or even to go into one of their luxurious boxes at some of the nicest Major League Baseball stadiums across the country. If Major League Baseball actually believed that Georgia was engaging in Jim Crow on steroids, like Joe Biden said, then they would have canceled all 82 games of the upcoming Major League Baseball season in Georgia. But the Braves still have home games. So what's really going on here? It's so obvious, and yet very few people are talking about it. The goal by the activist groups was to inflict pain music means the Hillsdale Dialogue is underway for the week, starting a little bit early this Friday because we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, Kevin Slack is an associate professor of politics at Hillsdale College. He got his BA from IU, Indiana. His MA, he's an Aggie like my wife, his doctorate from the University of Dallas. He is a Benjamin Franklin expert. He wrote the book, Benjamin Franklin, Natural Right and the Art of Virtue. We're so pleased to welcome here. And of course, we are joined by Dr. Larry Arndt, president of Hillsdale College. All things Hillsdale are included at hillsdale.edu. And the Hillsdale Dialogue once a week goes into a big subject or an old subject, and sometimes both. And Benjamin Franklin is both. Welcome to you. Dr. Slack, first time on the show. I, uh, I'm so glad to have a Franklin expert. Is he our most overlooked founder? I think that he's. Uh, I think that people uh, very much like Franklin. You know, when they when they they ask people, they find out that Franklin's the founder. That most people like to sit down and have a beer with. I think we often misunderstand Franklin. Uh, I think that uh, we look at him as somebody who was jovial, uh, who kidded around a lot, who was a genius when it came to you know, electrical fluid and so on. Um, but that we often overlook the role that he played as a political theorist. Uh, that Franklin was, was quite radical in his youth, and that some of the the other founders, like John Adams or James Madison, looked at Franklin and saw the importance, uh, saw the important role that he played in the formation of these this idea of republicanism that was so central to the Constitution. Now, in the Hillsdale Reader, which we are using uh, and which we're going to get through, we're going to start with the uh, his his memo to a, a young tradesman. But I want to jump ahead, Doctor Arn, to the the autobiography because I I think his thirteen virtues. 11 and 13 are the most memorable parts of that. Uh, the virtue he wanted, tranquility, be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents common or unavoidable. And number 13, humility, imitate Jesus and Socrates. Where have we heard that before? Yeah, there you go. Uh, he, he expands Aristotle's ethics, which has 11, I think. Um, but yeah, he, uh, Kevin has written quite a lot about this, but uh, Franklin, preached virtue and uh, was popular in part because of it. And he thought that being a virtuous people could be a free people and no other people could be. Because if you have to be constrained in all your activities, then the government will be overwhelming. And, and uh, if, on the other hand, you can just live your life, a thing that we're soon to pine for in America, the way things are going, then you can also have a chance to develop the virtues. So he, he was a he was a very, he was a, I've learned mostly from Kevin, by the way, that uh, he's a fundamental thinker. He's, uh, he's an amazing man. Uh, and, and Professor Slack, I am curious, everyone picks a, a specialty for a reason. What, what got you hooked on Benjamin Franklin? Uh, I think it was an interest in the American founding. Uh, and I, I wanted to pick somebody that I thought was the most reflective in this that the, the level of philosophy, Franklin is, is often engaged, particularly as a young man, in conversations in his writings with some of the leading thinkers of the world, uh, uh, and then also plays a major role in politics. And so he combines the intellectual, uh, the intellectual life with the political life in a way I don't think any of the founders 
uh, quite measure up to, even though that's uh, you know, a very powerful influence generation. There's an interesting thing going on with your phone, Dr. Slack. Um, we miss every fifth syllable or so. I'm not sure what that is if you're on a speaker or walking around, but I, I, I hate to lose even a syllable here. Um, would you give the quick, for the, the Steelers fans out there, would you tell them a little bit about Franklin's background? Because it's, it's unusual and formative. And Philadelphia matters a lot in this too. Yes. That um, Franklin, as a young man, Right, it grows up in Boston, and there he comes into uh, contention with the uh, the Puritan leaders uh, and, uh, in the church uh, that he associates with uh, the Massachusetts General Court, uh, the, the say the, the political rulers there. And so, as a young man, he's a genius, and he feels constrained, and so he begins to challenge them. Right, he describes this in the autobiography uh, uh, to the point where uh, he ends up leaving the town, uh, stowing away. He breaks an indentured contract with his brother, uh, and he leaves to go to Philadelphia. Uh, and there, he, it's like breath of fresh air. Um, and so he leaves briefly to go to uh, to London. He thinks he's going to obtain printing materials. He's encouraged to do so by the by the uh, by the governor, only to realize that he has been uh, betrayed. He lands in London to find out that the governor, Keith, has no credit to give, and so he's stranded in London. Uh, and uh, there he learns his trade as a printer. He comes back to Philadelphia, and he starts to work his way up as a citizen of Philadelphia, as a, as a printer, a journeyman printer, and then he establishes himself in the community. He begins to establish all these uh, private associations. Right? We have the subscription library, the Junto, which he describes as uh, this uh, association that's key for the, the uh, the development of morals and philosophy in the colonies. Uh, and then he takes on this political role. Uh, he's able to retire at the age of 42 because of his uh, the virtues that he describes. And then he uh, leads in the defense uh, of the province. So uh, in 1748, uh, he writes this essay, Plain Truth, to try to mobilize an extra-legal militia to defend the province uh, as part of uh, King George's war. Uh, he also is one of the founders of education uh, in Philadelphia, uh, as well as is establishing, playing a key role in the establishment of the hospital. So he's this central figure in Pennsylvania politics. He's elected to the assembly in 1751 uh, and becomes the leader of the popular party uh, in, the, uh, in the Pennsylvania legislature, and there conflicts with the uh, proprietors. Uh, and it's there that he formulates many of these arguments of social contract, the idea of the, the natural equality and liberty uh, of the citizens and their right to rule only by consent, uh, and then is able to um, uh, become a, a key player in articulating those views that become central to the American Revolution. For example, James Madison would say that the, uh, the, the theory of the American founding uh, in germ was present uh, in Franklin's letters to uh, William Shirley in 1754, and there he lays out this long argument for uh, consent of the people and Republican government. And of course, we kind of know how where it uh, follows from there. Franklin uh, signs all the major documents uh, of the American founding, right, the Constitution, uh, and so on. He, well, he is a tyro, Dr. Arn. And I, I mean, when you look back, I haven't read the autobiography in years, and I am reminded his energy level must have surpassed even that of Washington. And to go to London with no money, uh, I mean, Philadelphia's a pretty big city and Boston's not a small place, but to land in London and be penniless and to make your way in the world, and then to come back and become this, this tornado of civic mindedness, he must have stood apart. Well, the guy founded two Ivy League colleges. <laughs> really? I didn't know <laughs> that. Did. Yeah, U University of Pennsylvania and Columbia. <laughs> and and uh, I once looked up something interesting. I, I decided to look up the Ivy League colleges and see what they say about their missions. And uh, I can't find any of them except the University of Pennsylvania that refers to its mission anywhere prominent on its website. And it says that its mission comes from uh, Benjamin Franklin. And then it has a paragraph describing what the mission is. And all of the, all of the thoughts in it are utterly foreign to Benjamin Franklin. But that means he's powerful enough a figure in Philadelphia that they want they, they, they like to keep contact with him, even if they don't agree with him. Well, he is, he is an amiable figure in history. I, I've been to his home in Philadelphia, and I think, uh, Dr. Slack, you described what is the common 
understanding of him from Ben Franklin imitators who roam the country at conventions and, and we can <laughs> we can pick them out, right? And he's the amiable old man carried on uh, a, a cushioned chair to the Constitutional Convention who gives wittiest, witticism, but it, that's just not fair to who he, I mean, he's so central to everything. Yeah, I think, uh, and where he's really central, and this you know ties into to the reading that we had, is is in, is informing the constitution of a people. And by that, you know, at Hillsdale, there's this tradition of the great books that, that we keep alive. We often think of the constitution as a document or a piece of paper, uh, but the most important constitution is the habits of a people. And so Franklin, in these virtues, is trying to shape the habits of a people that will that will really allow them to be free. Uh, and in, the, in creating this middling element that he saw was so important for a commercial republic. So the constitution that Franklin really helps to shape that I think is most important is the way of life of a people that is then going to shape the interpretation of the document itself. Yeah, it's very interesting in the autobiography. He says, we have an English proverb that says, he that would thrive must ask his wife. It was lucky for me that I had one much disposed to industry and frugality as myself. He's very practical, Dr. Slack. He's not, he's not a philosopher with whom it is difficult to grapple. He's just very practical. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that when you think about Franklin's relation with his wife, I mean, it, it's also uh, the autobiography is somewhat coy. So uh, Franklin is, uh, he's describing himself as being incredibly thrifty. As he gets older, and he does admit to this, uh, they become, uh, they spend a little bit more money. He mentions his wife bringing in uh, you know, nicer, uh, you know, nicer objects into the house and so on. But what I like about that presentation is, is that Franklin is touching on some of the key things uh, that make a marriage possible, right? Some of these key practical things, right? Things like picking somebody who's industrious and frugal as you are, or, if you look at Benjamin Franklin's wife helping him in terms of running the store uh, and encouraging Franklin, uh, propping him up for the, the printing business, uh, uh, as I, opposed to some very, very romantic notion, uh, right, that, uh, that, that might sound good in the short term but might cost you in the long run. Yeah, this is not Jane Austen stuff. Uh, Dr. Arn, I'm curious about watching young men and women interact with Franklin for the first time. How, how, has that changed much? Do they marvel at him? Uh, well, we work in a really weird place, and so they're disposed to like old things or to take interest in them at least. Uh, Franklin is, uh, uh, yeah, I'll talk about my own case, but I see this in students sometimes too. Um, you can mistake that uh, Franklin is just talking platitudes. Uh, and uh, in fact, I mean, first of all, he's an incredibly sophisticated guy, right? He helped develop what we know about electricity. He did some of the first population studies in history. He's he's a, a person who he didn't discover the Gulf Stream, but he figured out how to use it for sea travel. And he got the – because he did that, the mail came to uh, Philadelphia and New York from England two weeks faster. Hold it. Hold that thought. We're going to come right back to the scientist right after the break. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back with Kevin Slack and Larry Arn. I want to remind you, Birch Gold, you're looking at the market go crazy. You're looking at prices rise and inflation is coming. Gold will be your best defense against massive inflation. It's down a little bit today at 1745 an ounce, but that's a lot far, farther up than it was a couple of weeks ago. Remember, Birch Gold, you can buy gold via HughGold.com, HughGold.com, or text my name, Hugh, to 474747. 47. Don't do anything crazy. Just put 5 to 10% into your retirement, and Birch Gold will teach you how to do that. Or buy some direct, which is what I do from Birch Gold. You can get in touch with them at HughGold.com or by texting my name, Hugh, to 474747. 47. I think inflation has to come, given on the amount of money that we are printing. But when it does, if you've got gold, you'll be fine. You'll also be fine if you've got your relieffactor.com in the car. I took it in the first hour. I reminded you about it in hour two and three. And so I always want you to have it with you, relieffactor.com. If you put it in your car, you can't forget it, even if you walked out the door in a hurry this morning. You can make sure, no matter how long or slow your commute is, it's sitting right next to you in the lime green bag with the North Carolina blue. I carry in curcumin, resveratrol and omega, the four ingredients that help you fight off all the minor aches and pains of getting old or getting your exercise. And you're doing both. You're, at least you should be doing both. 
relieffactor.com. Tens of thousands of people take it every single morning. You should be among them. I certainly am. Relieffactor.com, 1995. For the starter pack, I'll be right back with Dr. Slack and Dr. Arn on the Hillsdale Dialogue. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. Wait a minute. Did, did Senator Cotton say that the state of Delaware has fewer drop boxes than Georgia? What? Did, did Tom Cotton just say that Georgia, that, that, that Delaware rather, doesn't have any early voting at all? What? Yep, I mean, nothing like a few facts to get in the way of a narrative of lies. And it is a narrative of lies. Biden was asked, well, since baseball moved the All-Star game out of Georgia, should they move the Masters golf tournament out of Georgia as well? It is reassuring to see that... uh for-profit operations and businesses are speaking up about how these new Jim Crow laws are just antithetical to who we are. There's another side to it, too. The other side to it, too, is when they, in fact, move out of Georgia, the people who need the help the most, people who are making hourly wages, sometimes get hurt the most. I think it's a very tough decision for a corporation to make or a group to make. But I respect them when they make that judgment and I support whatever judgment they make. Oh, so you respect and support punishing black Georgians. Nice to know. What a unifier. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. I'm amazed that the Wall Street Journal has uh, pub- pub- published it. That it is time for half this country to fight back at Delta and Coca Cola and Major League Baseball. If you can avoid them, do it. They are creating a separate nation. So separate. That's it. There's, there's no choice. We will not enable those who destroy our country through lies. Delta, Coca-Cola, Major League Baseball in this case. Nike has already done it. So people ask, how can you fight? Right? You're just one person. You don't have a microphone like, let's say, someone like I does. And I understand. I understand that. I think there are many ways, including social media, but that comes with a price. And I understand that. I think people should be prepared to pay the price. You're not invading Normandy. But if you're not prepared to do that, do it in your own way. Get a different culture. Welcome back, America. Two here with Dr. Larry Arn, President of Hillsdale College, and his colleague, Professor Kevin Slack. Dr. Flack Slack is an associate professor of politics at Hillsdale and a Franklin specialist. When we went to break, Larry Arn, you were talking about his scientific genius. I didn't know about the Gulf Stream and getting the mail early, but but continue. He's yeah, he's a Renaissance man, but he's in the Enlightenment. Yeah, bifocals and uh, the glass harmonica. You know, he just. He he was a tinkerer in one way. He would, if he got to doing something, it would occur to him how to do it better. And he just invented things. And he 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 believed he's a very generous-hearted man. He's a very rich man. Uh, he believed that his invention should just be given out to the public. So he he, he inv- invented a better way to make a fireplace. You know, in the t- at a time when people depended on that for heat and cooking. And uh, he just, you know, he, so he just poured over. But then go back to something uh, uh, Kevin said. He wrote a, 
a long essay, 11 years, nine years, 11 years before the trouble started with England. Did you say 1754, Kevin? Yes. Uh, yeah, so nine years. And until 1763, people weren't mad at England, right? And England started doing stuff and taxing them mostly, but a lot of things. Tell them they can't go any farther west. And Franklin had had seen that before it became an issue. And that means that uh, James Madison was influenced by that. And James Madison was close to Thomas Jefferson. And so he did some wonderful original thinking that led to the American Revolution. I, I'm curious, Dr. Slack, is there much account of his interactions with Jefferson? Because what Dr. Arn just described is sort of Jefferson as well the amazing intellect in the middle of a political philosophy. Did they, were they pals? Did they have a, a record of common chat as Adams and Jefferson did? Oh, well, not, uh, not as extensive as that. I mean, there was obviously an age gap, but of course they, um, uh, they both uh, shared many things in common, their love of science. They were both inventors. They both very much were interested in the new experimental view of philosophy. Uh, as Dr. Arns just mentioned, Franklin, it wasn't just trying to understand how uh, how nature worked, right? Which he would even say was was good in and of itself. This understanding of nature and its laws, but he always wanted to uh, he always wanted to attach it to something practical. So whether it was the the Franklin stove or with uh, electricity, right? Recall he's the one who he he thought that maybe if you electrocuted a turkey or chickens, they would taste better. And so he uh, actually shocked himself so badly, knocked himself out one time. So he and Jefferson shared that, that love of experimental science, but also very much a love of democracy uh, and the possibility of this, this new Republican era that they both wanted to usher in. Now, in the next segment, we're going to come back to the letter to the young tradesman. But I do want to focus on uh, the amount of time he spends studying. You know, self-improvement is a, is a huge theme in everything in the reader. And as I recall from his autobiography at length, self-improvement, it is an obligation to work and to study. And is that unique in early American letters that are not pastoral? The, uh, the idea of self-examination and self-improvement I don't think is unique. What Franklin is doing is he's, he's trying to reconnect that uh, puritanical focus on self-improvement, examination of conscience. He's trying to reconnect it with a more natural understanding of virtue. Uh, and so you find in this whole treatment of the virtues, he begins with this idea of moral perfection and even talks about conquering natural inclination. He gives these examples of moral perfection. With, uh, or you say philosophically, in terms of classical virtues, somebody like Cato, a figure, uh, as well as appealing to the Bible. But then what you find is, is that the pursuit of moral perfection might actually hinder the proper ends of moral virtue, which is happiness. And so he has to reconnect the two, right? He realizes that uh, what he thought was moral perfection might just be a kind of foppery in morals. And what was most important was, was what were his actual habits and was he better off for practicing the virtues? And so that's one of the conclusions. He has that wonderful story of the axe, yeah. right, where a uh, man <laughs> yeah, goes to the axe it down. sharp and he wants every bit of rust, uh, he wants every bit of rust is scraped off. And then he realizes it's just this exertion, and he, uh, he finally concludes as a quote, a speckled axe best for something, right? I mean, the, the <laughs> basic end of the axe is as a tool for chopping down trees and wood. Uh, so he has to reconnect virtue to its proper end, which is happiness. Yeah, Dr. Arn, I, I am exhausted by reading his 13 virtues in his four-week program, his four-cycle program of a week each on the virtues. Uh, we have a minute to the break. Does, does anyone ever try that anymore? Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, everybody, you know, we work around young people who are all trying to make themselves better. And huge percentage of them are on a program all the time. There's, and that was, you see, one of the ways Franklin got rich was writing encouragements to things like that to people. Yes. Yeah. Well, we can, we'll come back next segment. We're going to talk about the tradesmen. I'm not sure we're going to get through Benjamin Franklin in one week. Don't go anywhere, America. The, uh, the Hillsdale Reader, by the way, through which we are guiding our audience in early American liberty, is the American Heritage Reader. It's available at hillsdale.edu. It's edited by the Hillsdale College History faculty. It's a wonderful, wonderful 
addition to a homeschooler's library and to anybody's library. Go to hilltail.edu and come right back after the break. I'll be back with Dr. Larry Arn, Dr. Kevin Slack as we continue to talk about Ben Franklin. Stay with us. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. But for you youngins out there, at one time, there were poll taxes in the South. You had to pay money in order to vote. Well, black people were poor, therefore they couldn't come up with the money, couldn't vote. Literacy tests. Blacks were not taught to read and write. Well, you can't uh, pass a literacy tax, you can't vote. Grandfather clauses. If your grandfather could vote, you could vote. Well, black people's grandfathers couldn't vote, so therefore they couldn't vote. That's what used to happen. But having to produce ID, having to verify who you are, that's worse than literacy tests, worse than poll taxes, worse than the grandfather clause. How insulting is that? And nobody says anything. One of these Biden administrators, Biden himself will say this, nobody says anything. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. President. Um, uh, my, my, my parents grew up in the South, and, and they told me stories about how black people were required to come up with a poll tax in order to vote, how black people were required to pass literacy tests, uh, and, and how black people were subjected to what's called a grandfather clause where they could only vote if their grandparents could vote. And you're, you're comparing the Georgia law, which all it does is say that you have to verify who you are and the majority of black people support photo voter ID. You're comparing it to that. Isn't that kind of insulting, insulting to people who went through that? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. So Atlanta is 52% black. The All-Star Game would have represented a $100 million economic stimulus to black-owned businesses, and thousands of black Americans would have been employed working in the All-Star Game or working in the activities around there. Instead, to try and protest racial injustice, Major League Baseball pulls the All-Star Game to go to one of the whitest metropolitan areas in the country, Denver, which is 10% black. So let me get this straight. To fight systemic racism, you pull an economic stimulus out of black-run businesses and communities into young, white, upper-middle-class communities in the mountains. That's your idea of fighting systemic racism and injustice? No, there's something else happening here. Of course, that wasn't their intention, and it's important to point that out because it actually does the opposite of what they say they're going to do, but there's something deeper happening here. On this program, and I encourage you all to check out our podcast, we talk, of course, about how Major League Baseball requires an identification when you go to will call tickets. Good luck going to Wrigley Field and saying, hey, I'm here. Give me my tickets. They're going to say, sir, we're going to need some identification. Well, according to the Major League Baseball catechism, according to Major League Baseball's new social teaching, according to Major League Baseball's school of ethics, that's racist. Yet Major League Baseball will require identification for all their employees and identification for anyone that goes to pick up tickets Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. This is pretty significant. More Americans support Georgia's new voter integrity law than oppose it. This is a morning consult poll just released. Despite Biden 
and Coke and Delta and Major League Baseball, despite all of that, this new poll shows 42% of Americans are more likely to support the law, 36% are likely to oppose it. Now, you may not consider that very significant, but it is. And the reason it's significant is to, to know that more Americans, despite all the garbage and the lies that they have been throwing at the American people over a common sense election law that makes it easier to vote and harder to cheat, that's a good sign. Here's Newt Gingrich on Fox News, cut six yesterday, talking about the lies that Biden is spewing with the despicable smear, calling it Jim Crow 2.0. Because he lies. It's not complicated. Uh, I got so incensed. I've done two podcasts at Gingrich 360 laying out this whole story. Stacey Abrams, who's making a lot of money out of this stuff, uh, she got the Jim Crow 2.0 website two weeks before the bill was passed. So they were setting this whole game up. I don't know how she got the president of the United States to talk about Jim Crow 2.0, but he did. So you see an exact linkage of what they're doing. Biden not only lied about the Georgia law, the Washington Post, very seldom taking on a liberal Democrat, gave him four Pinocchios, which is the most you can get, basically saying everything he said about the Georgia law was a lie. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. The calculation of Coca-Cola, the horrors of Coca-Cola, because th this is not conviction. They didn't even read the law. <laughs> okay, let's be honest. They fear the left more than they fear us. It's, that's all it amounts to. You know what this is? The left is, is like the mafia. It's protection money. That's all it is. I'll pay off the left, and then things will be quiet. It's protection money. So we have to tell them you're not, uh, you're not protected from the good guys. No more Coca-Cola and bye-bye Major League Baseball, which is very painful for fans. I, I'm, I love the sport, but I'm not a big fan. My producer has been in baseball fantasy league for decades. Sometimes he wins. He, he knows baseball so, so well. So Sean, the same thing. Sean has taken up polo. It's a fascinating sport. Lacrosse. You know, I finally watched the lacrosse game because I met a, I met a girl, daughter of some donor, who played plays lacrosse. The problem is that watching the game on TV, I never saw the ball. And I see the puck perfectly in a hockey game. It's black on white. Am I the only one? Do you have to train your eye? Have you ever watched a lacrosse game? That's a great sport. But it's, it's problematic on TV. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You know, I'm watching the Derek Chauvin trial, and Yamish Alcindor, one of the left-wing so-called reporters, she said that the Chauvin trial is not just about whether Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. No, it's about voting rights. It's about whether blacks in America will be treated fairly. Good morning, America. We are en route to the Hillsdale Dialogue. If you're just tuning in, we've been talking about Ben Franklin for half an hour. We being Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College 
and his colleague Kevin Slack, an associate professor of politics at Hillsdale College and a Franklin, Benjamin Franklin scholar. And now we turn to a, a, a short essay that is just wonderful, advice to a young tradesman. And I could tell you why I think it's wonderful, but I'd rather have uh, Dr. Slack tell us why it ought to be read by everyone and why it's in the Hillsdale uh, American Heritage Reader. Well, I, I think the reason is, is in Franklin's view that the, the virtues really emerged from a confrontation with necessity and that frugality and industry were two of the key virtues of the commercial republic that could, that could allow for a citizenry, the individuals to be free from any kind of a ruling class. So if you look at those virtues, uh, industry and frugality, they're not just virtues of the industry of desiring to acquire things that stir you from indolence, that get you off the couch uh, and get you to try to do something, right, in order to, uh, to gain. Um, but rather, it's a kind of virtue of the mind uh, that it propels us to order the world around us in, this, in the face of necessity. Uh, for example, Franklin would say uh, that uh, fear of sickness and old age ought to move us to virtue. Uh, and I, I like to tell the students, compare that to the later teaching in the, the 1930s, right, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the idea that necessitous men are not free men. Whereas for the founders, it was the confrontation with necessity, and particularly with Franklin, this confrontation with necessity that brought out these virtues that allowed you to be free uh, of some of those uh, baser uh, instincts. And if you look at the frugality, frugality is important because uh, it's not just saving the things that you, uh, that you earn. Uh, but it also frees you from certain desires that would make you slavish. Uh, and so uh, for Franklin, uh, he wanted people to be free in mind. So frugality, he actually equates with a kind of contentment. Uh, so in whatever station that you are in, and you're not going to be enslaved to these desires. Uh, one, one nice uh, uh, statement that he makes is a plowman on his leg. So the average American farmer is higher than a gentleman on his knees who's constantly in debt. And so that moral freedom is essential for a political freedom. You know, if, if we could get every young man and woman to read and believe this very practical advice about money, Dr. Arne, we would not have so many debt services and we would not have college debt at the level that it is. We would be much better off as a whole if everyone at least tried to adopt some of the Franklin practices vis-a-vis -vis money. Yeah, well... And as you point out, a lot of that's fostered by the government these days. You know, I, I, our auditors tell us that of the private colleges, uh, the typical one is collecting about $16,500 per student. The sticker price is actually thirty-eight, but they don't get that. But of the sixteen five, fourteen thousand comes from the government, and 9000 of it is loans. And, you know, young people take out these loans, and college is supposed to help their earnings. Uh, and they, you know, when it comes time to pay them back, they do have to pay them back. They're not dischargeable in bankruptcy. But the colleges themselves are not at risk. If they don't pay the money back, the college doesn't lose anything. And so that point, then, in other words, that's just pro profligacy, just written into the thing. And, you know, we have caps on how much money people can, can uh, borrow here. And, you know, we give, out, give away money like crazy to the kids. But... That you know they 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 have to develop because just think, you know what what would it if if you read Aristotle's Ethics for example Franklin Franklin reminds me of that very much right, it's a different kind of fellow Aristotle but he starts out with the the doing things, the things you have to do right and if you're a coward you're useless you're always quivering he says once you can't think if you're afraid of the bees buzzing. Right, mm. and and uh, and then you got to restrain yourself, right? Uh, you 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 you've got to be fair with people. That's a big one with Franklin. Pay your money back on time. Oh, can uh, I read that? I, I think this is. He, he writes, "He that is known to pay punctually and exactly to the time he promises may at any time and on any occasion raise all the money his friends can spare." This is sometimes of great use. After industry and frugality, nothing contributes more to the raising of a young man in the world than punctuality and justice in his dealings. Therefore, never keep borrowed money an hour beyond the time you promise, lest a disappointment shut up your friend's purse forever. 
That's a combination of virtue and practicality that is rare. Yeah. And see, it gives, but in Franklin, Kevin's the one who opened my eyes to this. Uh, Ke- Franklin, you know, Aristotle's ethics ends with the joys, the sublimity of contemplation of the ultimate things, right? That's the almost end thing. There's one little bit at the end. It's not that. Uh, Franklin, his own life, right? A lot of these speculations that he made, he didn't start out, he, he, Kevin points out, he was quick to want to invent something, quick to want to put something to use. But the first thing that attracted him was just the charm of it. Just, you know, I mean, he, he overhears these uh, uh, ship captains complaining that it takes them so long to get to New York from London, and others in other trades not carrying mail packets, they get there much faster. Why is that? Well, he just started asking around and collected lures for, lore from people who knew about the sea. And the next thing you know, he's figured out the Gulf Stream. And, and then, then, then he says, now, let's use this. Get here faster. Can you imagine Dr. Slack, Benjamin Franklin coming at you as a young man? I mean, not the not the archetype we have in our heads, but a, a young Franklin, a 35-year-old Franklin trying to figure out the Gulf Stream. And he doesn't go to taverns. He says he's not for carousing and he's saving all his money and he goes to the public library, which he starts. How would he come at people? Well, I, I think that's part of the, um, the, the fictitious Franklin. If you look at the young Franklin, uh, of course, they would always drink. They'd go to the Junto, and I don't mean uh, I don't mean they would get drunk, uh, but you know they would break out into you know into drink and song. Uh, I'd also point out that Franklin, we often forget, was a very big, robust young man who could get into fights. This is a very young man. I don't mean somebody who's you know 40 years old getting into fights. Uh, so Franklin, as a young man, might come at you, and it'd be quite intimidating. Um, I think Franklin, as older man, had learned how to be effective. And so when he, he describes the humility, uh, he doesn't think that uh, humility in, that, uh, in the, the puritanical sense is actually possible. He thinks humility is concealed pride. But he realizes that humility is necessary to really know himself, to be able to hear criticisms of himself so he can learn about himself. And on the other hand, it's very effective in trying to persuade people. So the older Franklin comes at you by talking to you. He was very pleasant in conversation, trying to figure out what moved you, and then trying to persuade you uh, to, be, uh, to take part uh, in, different, uh, 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 in different adventures in the city. So why would he even write? And I'm going to come back to you and talk about religion in our last segment. Uh, we got about a minute here, Dr. Slack. Why would he even write a letter to a young tradesman? What was the prompt for that? I think he himself uh, was, you know, he was part of this middling artisan class, um, and he sees himself as uh, playing this role in cultivating this middling element that is key to success a city. Uh, and it's, uh, he, he thinks that this is, uh, makes for a better political order, um, but also that it gives it more power uh, in the legislature. Uh, so I, I think he has uh, this, this moral end in mind. He really wants people to succeed. He's trying to help them on. And of course, he's, he's enabled by that as well. Many of these associations were for people to work together for their collective advantage, whether it was the Junto, whether it was the fire insurance company, whether it was the fire companies themselves, right? These all started off as private associations. Well, and the library began as a private. I, I am curious, though, he does not ground it in his Puritan upbringing or in his Presbyterian faith, which we're going to talk about in the next segment. We only have five minutes in the next segment. I want to talk about his, his, his real religious beliefs, because I think the... Uh, they shortchanged him a little bit in the note here. Uh, but does, does, does it all come from his belief that man is good or can be good? I think he thinks that, uh, that human nature is good, but that it's susceptible to many flaws. And so in one place he actually says, right, no human being is going to be perfect. We all have something to work on. On the other hand, he didn't like the teaching of original sin uh, that he found uh, in Presbyterianism. Yeah, okay, hold that. When we come back, the uh, the b- religious beliefs of Franklin are often wrongly reported and minimized, uh, and he's quite the student of faith. And it's it's very important to get it right because he's not, as many people will conclude, an agnostic or an atheist. He just isn't. And we'll let Doctor uh, uh, Slack explain that when we come back. Don't go anywhere, America. Final segment of this week's Hillsdale Dialogue is next. 
Don't forget to sign up for The Huniverse, all of Hugh's broadcasts on demand, The After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself, Dwayne FM, and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. These are difficult decisions. Do you want to listen to the medical profession? Do you want to listen to professional counselors? Do you want to listen to parents? Or do you want to leave all these decisions to uh, the legislators that come from all different kinds of background? Yes, they're elected to represent you, but they do not necessarily make the right judgments for parents and for doctors in the most sensitive issues. Did you hear what he said at the end? It's fascinating. Do you want to listen to the medical professionals, what, what like Dr. Fauci, that kind of medical professional, as opposed to, you know, the decisions of a legislature where people come from various backgrounds? Oh, what are those backgrounds that are problematic, Governor Hutchinson? Are they too white? Or are they too heterosexual? Are they cisgender normative heterosexual? Is that why in this one issue, they shouldn't be allowed to represent the people of Arkansas who elected them? No, 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 no. We can protect children from sex, from incest, from drugs, from alcohol, from pederasty, no, but when it comes to lopping off their sexual organs and filling them with chemicals to create a hormonal imbalance that they're not supposed to have naturally, well, let's forget the protections that we provide them on all of those other issues. You are a fake conservative. And if you listen to his answers, he's not a very smart person either. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Former President Barack Obama has weighed in on the controversy regarding Major League Baseball and the Georgia law. And Obama has praised Major League Baseball's decision to pull the All-Star game out of Georgia. Once again, somebody who could have done something to calm the country has thrown gasoline on it. He knows the Georgia law does not say that you can't give water to somebody standing in line. He knows that this law actually expanded the numbers of hours allotted for voting, not fewer. What Obama could have said, a statesman would have said, I've read the Georgia law, and while certainly we ought to be concerned about the history of voter suppression in America, there's nothing in this law that does anything but expand voter opportunities. Just as Senator Obama, when interviewed on 60 Minutes by Steve Croft, he was running and he was gaining on Hillary, but he wasn't the front runner yet. And Steve Croft said, Senator, if you don't get the nomination, will it be because of racism? To which Senator Obama said, no, it will be because I've not outlined a vision that the American people can embrace. Man gets elected. The Cambridge police acted stupidly. There's a place called Ferguson. Invites Al Sharpton into the White House over 80 times. Embraces the Black Lives Matter movement. Once again making things worse. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. On this program, and I encourage you all to check out our podcast, we talk, of course, about how Major League Baseball 
requires an identification when you go to will call tickets. Good luck going to Wrigley Field and saying, hey, I'm here. Give me my tickets. I'm going to say, sir, we're going to need some identification. Welcome back, American Chew, here at final segment of this week's Hillsdale Dialogue with Dr. Larry Arn, and who's the president of Hillsdale College, and Professor Kevin Slack, an associate professor of politics there. Dr. Slack is an expert on Ben Franklin, and so I, I just would like you to answer what, in his autobiography, he lets us know that the Presbyterians don't do it for him, and he's got a pretty bad preacher as a Presbyterian preacher. But what, what how do you summarize his religious view? I think you could break it into several parts. I think, first of all, and he gets into this in the autobiography, Franklin is quite atheistic. And what he meant by that was, and again, he describes it in the autobiography, is that everything is by necessity, and there's no such thing as human virtue. This is the position he has as a young man. He uses it in Boston to irritate all of the authorities, uh, to the point where the good people of the town, he says, viewed him with horror as being an atheist. The change that takes place uh, is not just one of Franklin's consideration of people's perception of him, but he actually goes back and he rethinks what atheism is. And he concludes, along with uh, some of the seminal thinkers for him, people like uh, Shaftesbury, that atheism really just meant perfect chance, chaos in the universe. And so uh, Franklin, in rethinking this, and he does this in a series of essays, challenges that initial position that he took. And he concludes that there is a kind of theism, meaning a pursuit of some kind of an order in the world, which he would call God and that there was limits to human knowledge, right? Limits to what it is we could know about God. For example, how it is the laws of nature we call physics work together with the possibility of human freedom. He also saw the necessity of virtue, not just in dealing with other people, but in considerations of his own life. So Franklin then um, is going to challenge orthodox teachings of Christianity for some of the same reasons he challenges atheism. Uh, if you'll notice his criticism of, of, of Jedediah Andrews, the, the Presbyterian minister, he says, I didn't like the sermons because, not just because he didn't agree with the, um, uh, some of the dogmas of Calvinism, but because he says that the sermons themselves were dry and uninteresting and unedifying. Uh, so he was waiting for the sermon on morals. That's what he's trying to learn about. And he finds that all that's repeated to him are religious duties and, and dogma and platitude. The second reason he doesn't like uh, the sermons is because he says they're politically divisive. He says their aim was to make us good Presbyterians rather than citizens. Yes. So what Franklin is, is trying to do is to re connect Christianity to moral virtue. He's trying to teach Christian morals as part of a natural law that could unify all the Christian sects in Pennsylvania. Well, when he says Jesus and Socrates as being his 13th idea of virtue, Jesus and Socrates, isn't he giving the game away a little bit, Professor, that he actually does? Humility, imitate Jesus and Socrates. If you're going to imitate someone and it's Jesus, Jesus makes certain truth claims. Did Franklin dispute those? I think he did, and I don't think this is much of a debate. At the end of his life, Franklin says to Ezra Stiles uh, that he, he was never certain of the divinity of Christ, right? So Franklin was not a Christian in any normal way that we would use that word, unless you were to talk about, as he says, Jesus as constructing this important moral virtue that we've adopted uh, in, in Christian society. Uh, on the other hand, Franklin is very cautious in his criticisms. He's very careful in how he treats Christianity, I would say, in the Middle East in the later part of his life because he realizes that there's something Christianity really offers to modern society, uh, particularly in its form of charity and goodwill. Uh, Christianity, Franklin, uh, connects to this notion of a desire to understand God in the laws of nature, uh, as well as a more peaceful understanding of commercial trade uh, that he thinks is superior to the ancient, uh, uh, the ancient mode. So Christianity for him provides a superior moral virtue uh, in its notions of equality and charity uh, one to another in society. Uh, so, whether Frank was an Orthodox Christian, um, uh, I don't think so. So Dr. Arndt, we're going to have to uh, impose upon Professor Slack again next week. I hope that won't be upsetting to you. But uh, I mean, we have barely scratched. We haven't done his political theory yet, right? We, we, we're just sort of covering the man. Okay, that's okay. The, Kevin is willing. If he is willing? Oh, I, I'm glad to hear that because I, I don't know how you teach or even expose people to Benjamin Franklin in, in one Hillsdale dialogue. And so we'll pick up there. But what would you recommend outside of the reader as the dispositive 
example of his political thinking, Professor Slack? Well, I mean, there are uh, some of Franklin's uh, major writings with the 1751 observations. Um, in 1760, he writes the Canada pamphlet. Um, so I, those, those are two of the, uh, the writings. Okay, that I, I, we will to. add you know those. What? You real quick, I will say the three letters to William Shirley of uh, 1754. They're reprinted in 1766 as part of this colonial argument for consent after the Stamp Act. Okay, the three letters to William Shirley, the 1751 observations in the Canada something. Uh, we'll, we'll be back to them. Dr. Larry Arn, President of Hillsdale College, Professor Slack, thank you both. Hillsdale.edu for all things Hillsdale, America. And we'll be back on Ben Franklin and wrap him up next week on the next Hillsdale Dialogue. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. This is pretty significant. More Americans support Georgia's new voter integrity law than oppose it. This is a morning consult poll just released. Despite Biden and Koch and Delta and Major League Baseball, despite all of that, this new poll shows 42% of Americans are more likely to support the law. 36% are likely to oppose it. Now, you may not consider that very significant, but it is. And the reason it's significant is to, to know that more Americans, despite all the garbage and the lies that they have been throwing at the American people over a common sense election law that makes it easier to vote and harder to cheat, that's a good sign. Here's Newt Gingrich on Fox News, cut six yesterday, talking about the lies that Biden is spewing with this despicable smear calling it Jim Crow 2.0. Because he lies. It's not complicated. Uh, I got so incensed, I've done two podcasts at Gingrich 360 laying out this whole story. Stacey Abrams, who's making a lot of money out of this stuff, uh, she got the Jim Crow 2.0 website two weeks before the bill was passed. So they were setting this whole game up. I don't know how she got the President of the United States to talk about Jim Crow 2.0, but he did. So you see an exact linkage of what they're doing. Biden not only lied about the Georgia law, the Washington Post, very seldom taking on a liberal Democrat, gave him four Pinocchios, which is the most you can get, basically saying everything he said about the Georgia law was a lie. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. The calculation of Coca-Cola, the horrors of Coca-Cola, because th this is not conviction. They didn't even read the law. <laughs> okay, let's be honest. They fear the left more than they fear us. It's, that's all it amounts to. You know what this is? The left is, is like the mafia. It's protection money. That's all it is. I'll pay off the left, and then things will be quiet. It's protection money. So we have to tell them you're not uh, you're not protected from the good guys. No more Coca-Cola, and bye-bye Major League Baseball, which is very painful for fans. I, I'm, I love the sport, but I'm not a big fan. My producer has been in baseball fantasy league for decades. Sometimes he wins. He's, he knows baseball so so well. So Sean, the same thing. Sean has taken up polo. It's a fascinating sport. Lacrosse. You know, I finally watched the lacrosse game because I met a, I met a girl, daughter of some donor, who played plays lacrosse. The problem is that watching the game on TV, I never saw the ball. I see the puck perfectly in a hockey game. It's black on white. 
Am I the only one? Do you have to train your eye? Have you ever watched the lacrosse game? That's a great sport. But it's, it's problematic on TV. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You know, I'm watching the Derek Chauvin trial. And Yamish Alcindor, one of the left-wing so-called reporters, she said that the Chauvin trial is not just about whether Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. No, it's about voting rights. It's about whether blacks in America will be treated fairly. I'm paraphrasing. I'm play the exact quote later on in the show. So to Miss Alcindor, who I know listens to my show every day. In the event that this trial has a result that you don't like, is it possible, just possible, that maybe, just maybe, a juror or more than one juror saw this trial differently? Is it just possible that one juror may feel that Welcome back. I'm Hugh Hewitt. My guest today is Ambassador Richard Grinnell, former ambassador to Germany, former acting director of national intelligence, by the way, the first openly gay man in both of those jobs and in the cabinet of the United States. Also special envoy for the Serbia-Kosovo peace negotiation. Uh, Rick's longtime partner, Matt, is much nicer to me than the ambassador is, but everyone says that about Matt. Rick is also a cancer survivor and encourager of everyone battling that disease, but now Rick Grinnell is back in California and is here today to talk about California. Good morning, Rick. How are you? Hugh, thanks for having me. It's always nice to be here. I, I have to begin with the breaking news. Prince Philip passed away this morning that we are taping this and talking. Um, you were an ambassador to a formerly royal, now a democratic government. I wonder if there are any hints of the old ways in the, in Germany, the ways of the Kaiser and that, that famed imperial family of which Prince Philip, I believe, was a relative, even though he was Greek and Brit. Look, I, I think that uh, what Europe has in terms of uh, the old guard, so to speak, is um, is something that's that creates stability. Uh, people absolutely welcome the royal families. They uh, see it as a great tradition. Uh, I think at this point, looking at Prince Philip and the Queen, we should all aspire to having a life of service, uh, a life of love. Um, I think what what the uh, what Prince Philip has given us in terms of service to his country and love to the queen. We can all aspire to have such an amazing relationship. I couldn't agree more. Now, I've read the Telegraph's obituary already. One more question, an American question. Do you think Meghan Markle will be attending the funeral? I don't think she should. I, I think that it would create too much um, distraction. It's a day of, of mourning for the family. Uh, I think what she did uh, truly was uh, despicable to go on TV and accuse uh, anonymously the royal family. I thought Prince um, Prince William has handled it extremely well, just a class act, and continues to push for service and loyalty. And uh, I, I hope that she doesn't go, and I hope that, that uh, Prince Harry does go. This needs to be a, a time where they honor the the tradition and the pageantry i think this is a time of healing now rick let's move to california you have moved back to california uh, why did you come back but first tell us when did you first move you're not originally from california when did you come to the golden state so i was oh gosh i have to remember i think it was third or fourth grade 
my family moved to the Bay Area, Redwood City, and I went to elementary school in uh, in Redwood City. And you know, my my mom's family has a long tradition of being in California, and so that's why we moved there when I was in elementary school. And then, as I became an adult, I, I went to uh, school undergrad in Missouri. Went to grad school in Boston. I worked on the Hill for a number of years, worked for, for Governor Pataki, and then came back to California to to work for the mayor of San Diego, actually, um, Susan Golding, in uh, in the late '90s. And in, one interesting fact is um, the future former mayor of San Diego, Kevin Faulkner, was uh, on our staff. Worked for for Mayor Golding for a little while. And the fetching Mrs. Hewitt worked for Mayor Golding before she became Mayor Golding when she and George uh, had a uh, job together. Let me ask you, though, you've come back to California, which is not a failed state in the sense of Somalia or Venezuela being a failed state, but it certainly is a failing state in United States terms. Why in the world come back here and not go to Florida with your boss, your former boss, uh, President Trump? or to Tennessee, where everybody in California seems to be moving, to Nashville. Why come back to California? Because if you don't live in California, then suddenly you find yourself in somewhere else. And for me, there's just no other option but California. I, I have a choice of either California or not. And I, I fundamentally think that the state is amazing. There's, there's no state that's more beautiful. Uh, it has incredible diversity. You know, California is known for being uh, far left, progressive, um, and I think that's only because we've had terrible one-party leadership for so long. And one-party leadership in a state is never good. Uh, you need to have a, a thoughtful discussion about the issues, and we just don't have that in California. Sacramento is a supermajority everywhere. Our media in Sacramento are afraid to take on the supermajority because their stories will, uh, their their information and access will suddenly dry up. And so we've had for now uh, way too long one party control and you see it in the decisions of Sacramento and now you see it in the, in the incredible frustration of the electorate. We have a lot of middle class Californians, people who are not famous, people who are not uh, wealthy, and those individuals who are the majority of Californians have watched Zoom school uh, create havoc on their children. We are the 50th state to, to open up, and yet we're still not even open. We're, we're still the 50th state in terms of, of trying to get there. Now, before we go into the litany of woes of California and talk to you about that, I want to get one more bio deal. Where did you go to high school in California? I didn't go to high school in California. I went to high school back in Michigan. My family moved back to Michigan. So I was born in Michigan, moved to California, and then my family, when I was in eighth grade, moved back to, uh, to, to Michigan, where my dad was from. That's why you're always suspect on sports. All right. Now, let's begin. The woes <laughs> of California are, are lengthy. Shutdowns, schools not open, sort of open, not really open, fires, the grid is, is shaky, the train to nowhere sits out there to be discovered in 3,000 years like that Egyptian city we are talking about this morning under a pile of uh, volcanic ash from Yellowstone blowing, and they'll wonder what the heck it is. I mean, it is a mess, Rick, and I left for, uh, for Virginia four years ago. I like to come back for December and January, and I've stayed longer this year to get the vaccine, and the rollout here hadn't been exactly good, but it's better than Canada's. What in the world happened? When I came here in 89, it was indeed a wonderland. We had George Duke Majin and Pete Wilson. Look, I, I think that we've had some very radical special interest groups that have done a very good job of convincing the politicians to concentrate on uh, really uh, in incredibly um, unrealistic policy issues and implement those policy issues and really ignore the big issues that need to be confronted. Let me give you an example. We, we have rolling blackouts in California. Why aren't we confronting growing our energy sources? We have no LNG terminals on the entire West Coast. We're shutting down production of, of crude oil. We've gotten rid of nuclear energy. 
um, it's worse than Germany in terms of the emotional decision-making process of Sacramento to respond to the emotionalism of radical interest groups. Meanwhile, we are suffering. I'll give you another example. We, we're not cleaning up dead trees in the forest. We're allowing those trees to, to die, the brush to die. We're not removing it. We're not managing the forest in a way to say, uh, hey, maybe we should start removing some of these trees as they die so that they won't create forest fires. We don't do that because some environmental crazies have decided that that's a bad idea. It actually would open up our timber industry if we allowed the timber industry to responsibly move in and clear the brush, clear the dead trees or the dying trees, and manage the forest like most other states do. Uh, you look at the water issue. We live on the ocean in California, and yet we're telling people, don't water your grass, quick, quickly take a shower. We keep talking about uh, conserving water, and we do nothing about the water supply. And I, I just keep saying to my friends in California who are in leadership positions, the Middle East has figured this out. You can live in the desert and have as much water as you want, but you've got to do things like desalinization. You've got to change your water policy. We're not building dams in California <clears throat> because, again, the radical environmentalists have somehow convinced us that that's a bad idea. I'd like so to point out to people, there is a functioning desalinization plant in Carlsbad. There's an experimental plant in Huntington Beach. But, and those are very fine little projects, but if we did it the way that Israel and Saudi Arabia and uh, the Gulf states do it, we would have a desal plant every 100 miles or so up the California coast, and the cost per water acre would go down dramatically, and the cost of experimentation would go down dramatically. Drought is a choice in California, and the choice that the Democratic Party makes is for drought because it empowers bureaucracy. That's my view, Richard Grinnell. No, I think that that's exactly true. And let's go back and look at uh, the, the small desalinization plant that we've been able to get. It was hard fought. It took way too long. It was incredibly expensive. There was uh, a lack of support, let's put it that way, from, from the state government. It took incredibly long to look at the evidence that we live on the ocean, because I do think that it is a choice that the, the far left management of the state is making is that they would rather listen to the radical interest groups than do the policies that the majority of Californians expect us to do, which is to have clean water available, to have uh, clean air that, uh, that, that allows us to not shut down businesses. And, and instead, we have been told by Democratic leadership that you've got to pick one or the other, dirty air or dirty water. And that, it's, I, I served on the California Air Quality Management District in the South Coast. Pete Wilson's appointee. It's simply not true. We've got beautiful air out here and we have clean water, but we have re a regulatory system that's broken. Let me begin with those interest groups, Richard Grinnell. We've got uh, California Teachers Association. We have the prison guards. We have the tribes. We have the SEIO, which is both uh, public and, and private. We've yes. just got uh, public employee unions and affiliates that have a stranglehold on Sacramento, probably because of a bad idea that I supported at the time, term limits. Term limits seem like a good idea at the time as a way to break the power of Willie Brown. And in retrospect, we shouldn't have broken the power of Willie Brown. The state might still work, but we did and we're stuck with it. And now those groups rule California. And I'm not overstating it. Those groups rule California. 100 percent. They, they are uh, radical interest groups that are interested in, in their leadership, pay, in, in membership, rather than giving their members policies that work. And we've got to figure out how to break that system. And, and I do think that we're at that point. I think that about 10 years ago, many Republicans decided that California needed to to just be an ATM for the rest of the country, to have uh, House races and Senate races that we would support. It was easier to pay for a 
Senate race in North Carolina from t- California dollars than to fight for our own uh, Senate seat in California. These are the, these are the uh, decisions that Republicans made about 10 years ago. In essence, we gave up. We said, let's let the left implement these crazy policies. Let's let them take us off the cliff so that at some point we'll have evidence to show the electorate that their policies took us off the cliff. Well, I believe that after a year of Zoom school and a year of having everything shut down, the electorate has seen California. You've seen the homelessness completely take over our cities. Uh, we, we now have seen what democratic policies in California do to the extreme. They've taken us off the cliff. And now we have an electorate that's saying, I, we've got to change course. We've got to do something different. I'm hoping that we can make this permanent change, that we can go into every county and clean up the voter rolls, demand voter ID, and and increase voter registration at the same time, and give the voters a fundamental transformational policy that I believe will, will begin to take the state in a different direction, and that is to upend the way we fund education in California and to have the money, the the incredible amounts of money that we spend on, on students, $25,000 per student is, is one uh, estimate. I think it could be higher than that. Take that money and ask the voters, do you want that pot of money per student, per pupil, to go and follow the student's decision as to where to go to school and the family's decision? Whether it's private school or a government-run school, let the schools compete for the dollars and let the families choose where the money goes. Now, Rick Rennell, before we go to the recall effort that is underway, it hasn't qualified yet. We don't know if it, it will. I want to pause on something you said. California has become the showroom for American socialism. There is no doubt about it. This is where American socialism lives on the left coast. We have a tax system like that. And if you ask the Democrats in California, the problem is we do not tax enough and they are proposing a wealth tax now, having snuck through a change to Prop 13, the answer in a one party state committed to left wing ideology is always higher taxes. Do you think that the rest of the country has any idea of the tax structure here and what is being proposed in the assembly in the Senate of California right now, a wealth tax? No, I don't think anyone understands just how bad California is. Uh, They've, uh, I think, over the last year, because of COVID, haven't been able to visit, and we've seen the state completely go off the cliff. Uh, But I want to say one thing that that I think is a little bit different, and I think the messaging is really important. I don't believe that it's Democrats of California that have decided to do that. I think it's Democratic politicians in Sacramento, because what I can tell you is that the electorate in California – are not happy right now. They have seen, there's been a wake up, and they have seen that these uh, complete ridiculous policies of increasing our taxes yet again, without delivering any services, without seeing any change, and still asking us to conserve water and watch as wildfires take over and homelessness come around. People are not interested in paying higher taxes, even Democrats in California. They have begun to say this is not the answer anymore. We've got to do something different. And I, and I can't emphasize this enough. There is a, a real uh, shake going on in California. It's an earthquake and it is with the electorate in California. I have seen Democrats and declined estaters in in California, which is our our largest uh, party, they are focused on making sure that we do something different. And I'm not suggesting that they're gonna vote for Republicans, but they absolutely do not want to see the direction of the state stay on the course. I want to, uh... I remind everyone of James Q. Wilson, the great social scientist who began at Harvard, ended his career at UCLA, wrote the book, The Moral Sense, also coined the term of the broken windows theory. If there were broken windows in a neighborhood, it attracted more trouble, and that if you fix the broken windows, you would be moving. The human equivalent of the broken window is a homeless tent or cardboard house on the street. The city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles has 70,000 unhoused people. I recently went to Skid Row with Judge David Carter for a hearing 
of the district court there. And I hadn't been to Skid Row in 20 years since I covered it for KCET. It is a zombie apocalypse. I have never seen anything like it outside of the worst slums of Argentina and Brazil. And Rick Grinnell, it's almost impossible for me to imagine a solution, but that the unhoused is in fact the broken window of today. And it is everywhere in California. It's not just LA, it's in Orange County, it's in San Diego, I'm sure it's in the desert. I know it's in San Francisco and the North Coast. What do you think? I actually think it's probably the number one issue that is discussed when Californians get together to talk about what ails their their state. They immediately turn to the housing encampment they saw under the freeway on which they drove. I, I can't emphasize this enough for people. It is absolutely the number one question when you go to see anybody. You immediately open the door to you, to your friend's house and you say, I haven't driven this way in so long, and I can't believe how many homeless encampments are here. It is a topic for the next 15 minutes. We live uh, in Manhattan Beach, California, and I don't know if you remember Dockweiler Beach. Here, sure, but sure. Dockweiler Beach right now is being debated on whether or not the entire beach will be a homeless encampment. They have proposed moving the homeless to oceanfront property where there's a public beach, where the public has been uh, allowed to park for free and to to enjoy the beach. This is a middle-class luxury. This is the vacation for middle-class Californians who can't afford to go to Disneyland or take a trip somewhere else. They come to the beach where it's free. And now what they are proposing is to turn that entire beach and parking lot Beautiful Pacific Ocean front property available to Californians. Turn it into a homeless encampment. People are furious that they can't control this process, and and this is not a uh, you know th this is not a problem that that just arrived overnight. This has been going on for three and four years, and people have watched it creep up on us. And, and now what we have is an entire political establishment of far-left Democrats who are just going to keep taxing people to keep paying for new homeless encampments. We've got to change our policies. Otherwise, we are going to become a slum state. You know, I, I attended that hearing. I learned something that's amazing, Richard Grinnell. Manhattan Beach is in Los Angeles County, but it's an incorporated city, so it wouldn't apply specifically to it. But in the in the county's inventory of property is Old County USC General Hospital. 14 or 17 stories of empty rooms with bathrooms and showers that is not used. It's not used. And yet they have 70,000 homeless people in the county of LA and they're moving them to the beach. It's actually the most dysfunctional thing I've ever seen. It's a government with all of the responsibility and none of the authority because LA City is divided into 14 uh, basically monarchies, the city council district, a hapless, hopeless mayor who presides and doesn't decide, and then tiny little satellite cities like Manhattan Beach, which cope as best they can, although I haven't heard about that plan. That plan is nuts. I usually spend Saturdays when I'm in California at Huntington Beach, and the homeless problem has appeared there too, but not in an organized way, sort of startling. Hadn't been there for the 25 years I've run at Huntington Beach. But is that a Manhattan Beach City Council initiative or is that the county of L.A. saying this? No, it's the county of, it's the county of L.A. Oh, my gosh. And, and the county is, uh, let, let's be very realistic. The county is so weak that if they make this decision to house homeless at Dockweiler Beach, that will never go away. You will never be able to peel that back. That will be a homeless encampment for the rest of eternity. And so I, I think rather than keep supplying encampments, we have to deal with the homeless problem. I don't think it's compassionate, Hugh, to, to look the other way when someone is soiling themselves on the sidewalk in front of your business or in front of your coffee house. I actually think that we have to start being honest about the, the, the problems. Many of these people, the majority, the overwhelming majority, are not homeless as much as they are addicted to drugs or alcohol. And we need to start saying that it is more compassionate to force people into treatment 
than it is to look the other way as they're soiling themselves on the street. Three categories. I know you're evangelical. I know that you have a heart for these folks. And I know, because I've been working on the, the matter, I'll be writing about it for The Post, three large categories of homeless are the mentally ill, the addicted, and the economically uh, dis- uh, crisis. And it's the, the last or the easiest to deal with. You rapidly rehouse them and you give them first and last month rent and you get them into an apartment. The first two are hard to deal with but can be dealt with. I talked to a Democratic mayor this week, Rick Grinnell, uh, Mayor Quentin uh, uh, Mayor Q of Kansas City, as he's called, Quentin Lucas. And they're doing very innovative things in Kansas City, Democratic City. They're buying old housing units and having homeless people move in and repair them and occupy them. The kind of innovation you would never get out of Los Angeles County or city, they're two different jurisdictions, because it's just completely dysfunctional. It doesn't work. Nothing works in LA. Look, if you're mentally ill or you're addicted to drugs or alcohol, we can't give you a house because that's not the solution to your problems. I agree with you that, that anyone who is in a financial crisis, uh, there, there are um, many organizations, churches, that will step up and help legitimate economic uh, crisis situations. And I believe that we have uh, plenty of good hearts in California.